Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello and welcome, wonderful people, to my first show of 2023. 2022 was an absolute triumph for this show. Thanks to you guys, our viewer and listener figures have been nothing short of amazing. So thank you very, very much. It's much appreciated. But my New Year's resolution, well, is to keep doing the news a bit differently. High tempo, full throttle, no holds barred. So with that in mind, let's have it. People are sadly dying because they can't get a GP appointment. There are massive waits in A&E and critical incidents are being declared at NHS Trust right across the country. GB News can exclusively reveal the first migrants of 2023 have been picked up making the Channel crossings. That's despite British Border Force officials now on French beaches. That's as of today. 2022 was a record year in the Channel. Unacceptable numbers of people in taxpayer-funded hotels. Hundreds of millions of pounds spent, squandered some would say. How do we crack the migrant crisis in 2023? And new polling shows that millions of voters are undecided about who to vote for at the next general election. I'll have MPs, experts, academics and ordinary members of the public just like you between now and 6pm. Get in touch, get yourself on the telly, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Two top topics for you today to get in touch on. Do you think there will be more or fewer channel crossings in 2023? And that second topic is, what would Rishi have to do to get your vote? gbviews at gbnews.uk. Get yourself on on the telly, but before that, it's your latest headlines. Patrick, thank you. Good afternoon. It's one minute past three. This is the latest from the GB Newsroom. And GB News can exclusively reveal the first channel migrants of this year have arrived at Dover Harbour. Dozens of mainly young men were picked up from a small boat around nine miles off the Kent coast. It's understood there were more than 40 people on board the inflatable boat. It's as UK and French authorities have started patrolling beaches together for the first time in a bid to stop migrants crossing the channel. Well, three people and a dog died at the scene of a fire that broke out at a hotel in Perth. Police Scotland confirmed 11 people were also treated for minor injuries. Emergency services were called to the New County Hotel in County Place around 5 o'clock this morning. Scottish Fire and Rescue say 60 firefighters were at the scene along with nine fire engines. In a statement, they called it a very complex incident. Health bosses are calling for the government to declare a major incident within the NHS over mounting pressure on the service. The Society for Acute Medicine has called the current situation urgent, whilst NHS providers says the service is under the same levels of pressure as during the early stages of the COVID pandemic. It follows the Royal College of Emergency Medicine saying as many as 500 people could be dying each week because of delays to critical care. More than a dozen NHS trusts and ambulance services declared critical incidents over the festive period. The government said it recognised the pressures faced by the NHS. 
and some people are resorting to DIY medicine when they can't see a GP face to face. A recent survey commissioned by the Lib Dems shows more than one in four adults have not been able to get an in-person appointment in the past 12 months. 16% of those who can't see a doctor have resorted to homemade medicine or asking someone not qualified to help. The Department for Health and Social Care says it recognises the pressures GPs are under and are working to increase access for patients. Two men charged with the murder of 23-year-old Cody Fisher in Birmingham have been remanded in custody. 21-year-old Cammie Carpenter and 22-year-old Remy Gordon were also charged with a fray, which they both pleaded not guilty to. The non-league footballer Cody Fisher was killed on the dance floor at the Crane nightclub on Boxing Day. The defendants will appear at Birmingham Crown Court on Wednesday. Ukrainian authorities are claiming around 400 Russian soldiers have been killed after a missile strike in the occupied Donetsk region. Officials in Russia have, however, disputed that figure, saying around 60 died in the attack. Neither claim has been verified. It follows President Vladimir Zelensky saying his country's forces shot down 45 Iranian-made drones fired by Russia last night. Actor Jeremy Renner is being treated for serious injuries after a snowplowing accident. A publicist for the 51-year-old says he's in a critical condition but considered stable. The details of the accident are unclear. The two-time Oscar nominee is best known for his performances in The Hurt Locker, The Town and for playing Hawkeye in the Marvel movies. The wake for Brazilian footballing legend Pelé has started at the Santos football stadium where he played. Fans started to gather last night near the Urbano Caldera Stadium, that's Pelé's hometown club, for the mass 24-hour public wake. The three-time World Cup winner died on Thursday at the age of 82 after battling colon cancer for just over a year. And Prince Harry says he wants his father and brother back in an interview to be televised days before his memoir is released. ITV say the interview with the Duke of Sussex will go into unprecedented depth and detail about his life in and outside the royal family. A preview clip shows the prince saying it never needed to be this way. Meanwhile, in a separate interview with CBS News, he criticises Buckingham Palace over an alleged failure to defend him and his wife, Meghan Markle. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Patrick. Yes, welcome back, everybody. This is Patrick Christie's right here on GB News. Let's get stuck straight in because a &E departments across the country are in a... Quoting now, complete state of crisis. It's that time of year again. So says the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. The situation is being driven by rising demands for care due to an increase in cases of both flu and COVID. A number of hospitals have declared critical incidents, meaning they cannot function as usual due to extraordinary pressures. The boss of the Royal College of Emergency Care says reports of a 500 people a week dying due to delays in emergency care, while not confirmed are more than a guesstimate. So let's just assume, realistically, around 500 people a week are dying as a result of delays in emergency care. We're going to take that figure pretty much as standard throughout the course of this show. With that in mind, let's cross to Theo Chikomba, who's actually at the Stoke Mandeville Hospital in Aylesbury. Now, this is one of the hospitals that's declared a critical incident, isn't it, Theo? What's going on there? Yeah, you're right. You mentioned it there. Um, the hospitals across the country are facing a challenging situation and this hospital uh, here in Buckinghamshire is one of those to declare um, a critical incident. Now, they were talking about some of their challenges and worries leading up to this bank holiday weekend, saying, you know, we don't have the staff uh, to deal with what's happening at the moment, but also lack of investment uh, from the government. And the government will say in their last statement they invested around £3.3 billion extra into the NHS to last over the next few years. But of course, we heard from health bosses today who are saying this simply isn't enough particularly to deal with what's happening at the moment. It's been described similar to what they saw uh, during the beginning of the pandemic just a couple of years ago. So those are the pressures that they're under at the moment. And they're saying they want to be able to give care to patients uh, in the right way. But of course, that needs manpower and of course, investment as well.
Theo, thank you very, very much. This is Theo Chicombo. There is outside Stoke Mandeville Hospital for us. Just want to give you a little bit of a view from the ground. And this crisis in emergency medicine is just one part of the NHS that's at tipping point, OK? And we want to pick these apart throughout the course of the show. I'm sure, like you, you I woke up to headlines this morning anyway about, you know, A&E delays causing around 500 deaths a week. I've got record numbers of people are desperately trying to go private because they're not happy with NHS care. We're looking at the fact that hospitals are overflowing, supposedly people waiting elderly, especially a very long time in A&E. We've got these strikes. We all know about the strikes. So I wanted to do a bit of a deep dive today into what's really going on in the NHS. I'm sick of hearing about these problems. I'm desperate to hear some solutions. And that solution cannot just be more money. It cannot be a bottomless pit. New research reveals that people are reportedly resorting to self-medicating because they can't get an appointment with their GP. And I suspect a lot of this stems with a lack of ability to get support from a GP. Every day, there seems to be reports of GP practices closing. Patients unable to register or GPs having the profession, leaving the profession in droves. And if you can't get an appointment with a GP, then, of course, what happens? Well, you go to A&E, don't you? And you add to the crisis. Well, to shed some more light on this, I am joined by NHS GP David Lloyd. David, thank you very, very much. I'm reading reports here of around 500 people a week dying due to A&E delays. Is any of that, in your view, caused by an inability to get a GP's appointment? I, I'm afraid I think it is. Uh, I think the, the A&E department is rather like the thermometer that measures the temperature of the NHS. And when A&Es start to fall over, it means that they, there are lots of things going wrong with the rest of the system. So the hotter it is in the A&E, the more likely that other parts are failing, and general practice is one part of that. OK, all right, so what's gone wrong there, then, and how do we fix it? There's not enough GPs, they're leaving, so we need more. Is it as simple as that, and we have to pay them more? <laughs> well, I thought you, I thought I'd been listening to you as you were going along. I thought you went, didn't want people to start talking about money and everything else and look at imaginative solutions. Well, that's what I'm solution. trying to get down to because there's got to be another solution, hasn't there? I mean, is it simply pay? Well, I think it's about pay and morale, and, and I think it's about a, a plan. Basically, uh, I think we all need to to know that, that this government or that the people of this country feel that the NHS is worth saving. If it is. Then, then we'll be very pleased and we'll work with everybody to try and make it better. I think but it I, was. I, I was it not? Wonder, I wonder whether that's the, the truth. What do you think? Well, was it not, JFK said, think not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country? If people are already in our healthcare system, should they not be the ones to try to help sort it out, not throw their hands up and do one? How do you mean? Well, we've got people leaving in droves, people complaining a lot of the time, people going yeah, on strike, yeah. for example. Should it not be those yeah. people who are the ones to actually fix this and put their shoulders to the wheel? You did voluntarily go into medicine? Yes, no, absolutely. I went into medicine and I've loved medicine for all my 40 years in doing it. Uh, yes, you're right. I think we should be suggesting to the government that the way's forward and I can give you some ideas if you'd like them. Please, But I, please. I, do, I do think that we need to... I need, I need somebody at the top needs to say the NHS is important for NHS... For the for GB Limited, because a, a functioning health service means a functioning country. Okay. Okay. Great. Right. So, please, please, please. I get. By the way, David, I do get, and I've been listening to a lot of GPs, a lot of medical professionals say this time and again. And let's be honest, they can't all be wrong, and it seems completely reasonable. I get that people have been trying to pitch solutions, and I get that they haven't really necessarily been listened to, and that is a fault of our politicians. I do understand that. But okay. do it again now, all right? So come on, pitch me some, <laughs> so, right. pitch me, pitch me some solutions. At least I'm listening. OK, well, all right. Well, I think we, we need to understand that we're in a, a competitive marketplace in the world. Uh, we can't go on relying on taking in doctors and nurses from poorer countries, which has been an absolute plan ever since the NHS started. We've had doctors coming in from, from poorer countries and nurses, and they've done a they're doing a fantastic job. But those countries now need those doctors themselves and they need those nurses. So we need to have more homegrown doctors and nurses. And that means more medical schools, more nursing schools, uh, and a greater emphasis on, on training people up to be the doctors and nurses of the future. What about that one? Yeah, no, I'm, I think that's great. I mean, the only counter that I would have is that in a time of crisis, should we be more selfish? Should we be looking to brain drain the best of the medical talent from around the world as opposed to taking the time to train ourselves? We need GPs now, don't we? We need nurses now. Bring it on, world. I, well, you see, I, that's where I, I, I think that sometime we've got to draw a line. We've got to say, no, we are not going to drain the rest of the world to save the NHS. We can't let countries 
that have got far more problems than us send us, send us doctors because we pay them more money. We need to make a decision about growing more doctors and nurses in the UK. We've got the medical schools, they're already up and running, but they can't see patients, they can't take in UK doctors at the moment because the government won't let them. So they're charging okay. enormous quantities of money okay. to train doctors for other countries. Here we go. So this is a key point. So why won't the government let them just throw their doors open? I mean, let's be honest, this country's thrown its doors open in numerous other departments. Why can't we throw our doors open to British citizens who want to train to be GPs and healthcare assistants, etc.? Thank you. Could you say that frequently and often? That would be great. Look at my down the road where I, where I, uh, where I work. We've got Brunel University. They have a new medical school. And they're not training any UK doctors. Why? Why? Because they haven't got the money from the government. And so they're having to survive. They're having to charge foreign, pay, foreign medical students coming to this country and getting our fantastic training. Is there a situation with medical professionals in this country at the moment getting trained in this country and then going abroad? That's always going to be the case. There are always going to be doctors moving in and out of the country. And just, I mean, you're going to hate this one, but that's another one. We've always, we've always had a steady flow of European doctors and nurses coming through, getting their training as junior doctors, providing a valuable service to the NHS, and then going back to their country again. They rotate. And likewise, we rotate through Europe, used to rotate through European countries. But I'm afraid because of that B word, that has stopped working. We have nurses now who will not come and work in this country because their training is not recognized by their home country. My, my son is a doctor. His, his partner is a Spanish nurse. Mm. She has had her training taken away from her in Spain uh, and so cannot return to Spain. But that's a nonsense, isn't it? But that's, yeah, but that is just an absolute nonsense uh, and an example of a deliberate attempt by our European friends to try to do Britain down, because realistically there's no shame or no reason whatsoever why they wouldn't have to recognise the qualifications that a nurse gets in this country, the same or a doctor, the same qualifications that they've been getting before. That is an attempt by our European quotes and quotes friends to kind of pull a slime on everyone, which I would argue is maybe another good reason why we actually... Are, you, are you sure that it's our friends and not ourselves? Well, yes, because they're the ones doing it, aren't they? We're still recognising no, them. No, they're not the ones doing it. It's us refusing to let European doctors and nurses come and work in our country. But why are we refusing to let them work in our country? Because of Brexit, Patrick. No, but what exactly? This is the thing, because people often throw their hands up and go, because of Brexit, this, that and the other, but what, what actually is it? There is, <clears throat> there is now a barrier to doctors and nurses from Europe coming to work in the UK, and that barrier is this government. OK, so this government needs to what? Needs to do exactly what? We're trying to look for solutions here, Dr Davies. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to break down the barriers and become a fully-fledged member of the European Union again, but at least recognise no, that there are doctors and nurses from Europe that we can you, take you for You know... While. You know a lot better than me. This is your field of expertise, right? I voted for yes. Brexit. I, I voted for a very different version of Brexit than the one we've got now. I get that. I am not necessarily, absolutely, across every single minute detail of the impacts across every single industry that Brexit has had. So you're telling me that, in this particular case, we have simultaneously refused or not creating the conditions to train enough of our own GPs and simultaneously yes. creating a barrier for foreign GPs, etc. That's clearly a massive problem. Is there anything to be said, Dr David, as well, for the GPs that we already have in this country, maybe wanting to do things like going down to a four-day week, working nine to five? I remember towards the back end of the pandemic, it seemed very, very tricky to try to get GPs to do face-to-face -face appointments. Absolutely, and I totally agree with that. The video consultation system was fantastic during COVID, but we're sick to death of it now. Mm. Uh, it's a complicated system, uh, and we need to see more patients face-to-face. -face. We are seeing more patients face-to-face. -face. The data from the people that collect this say that we're seeing more patients face-to-face -face than we've ever done before in general practice. Mm. But there is an enormous, enormous demand. You mentioned about p patients taking their, their health into their own hands. Uh, I saw a person with a lump last week they tried to take off themselves, uh, and it was a horrible mess, and I'm going to enjoy taking it off tomorrow afternoon when he comes to see me. But okay. th 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 that's what people are doing because they're so desperate to see it a is. doctor now. Now, I just want to keep you on the line if that's all right. I just want to have a quick chat with Lisa King, who sadly was widowed when she says her husband was not able to get a face-to-face -face GP appointment, and this was back in 2020. And I believe Lisa... 
joins me now. Lisa, thank you very, very much, bless you, for taking the time to, to come on the show and have a quick chat with me. Would you mind, if it's OK, just in light of the news stories, the horror headlines that we're reading today about patients suffering as a result of not being able to see GPs, for example, and therefore waiting a long time in A&E, et cetera. Would you mind just explaining your experience to our viewers and our listeners, please? OK, thank you, Patrick. If, if it's um, all right for you to do so, Lisa, you don't have to. Yeah. No, right. no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, we're going back to July 2020 now. Um, my husband had had pains in his stomach. Um, so I emailed the GP, as I'd always done, to get an appointment for him face to face. I outlined where the pain was. I outlined how serious it was and how much pain he was in. I said he needed to be seen face to face. Um, I got an email back saying, no, um, you have to fill out an online form. But however, on this occasion, the GP will call. The GP did call. My husband told him how much pain he was in. He, he couldn't describe how much pain he was in. So the GP decided um, after a chat that he had acid reflux and he prescribed him tablets for that. After five days, the pain was still there. In fact, it was worse. He was screaming in pain. He was violently sick. I called an ambulance. Um, they took him to hospital and he had a gallstone trapped in his bile duct. They couldn't operate on him because he had peritonitis from the delay of uh, not seeing the GDP and being sent straight to um, the hospital, to A&E. For three weeks, um, he was on very strong antibiotics to remove the um, infection that he had. Um, mm. He went back to the hospital after that and they said that because of his uh, underlying health condition, he had a condition called genetic hemochromatosis, which had been missed by the GP for six years prior to this episode. Um, he uh, was told that um, he would have his gallbladder removed in October, the latest beginning of November. Um, at the beginning of October, I had the pain again in his stomach. Called an ambulance and they came within 20 minutes. He was white around his mouth and his nose. When the ambulance arrived, he was speaking to them. He was telling them about his underlying health condition. He was telling them about what had happened with his gallbladder before. And then he just collapsed. Just collapsed. He, um, okay. The ambulance right. crew, the ambulance crew called back up. They called the air ambulance. Um, he had 14 shocks from the delivery. 14 mm. shots they gave him and they couldn't save him. He had a heart attack. Okay, Lisa, <laughs> all right. Okay, well, incredibly, incredibly sorry to hear that. And can I just say what an incredibly brave lady you are to come on and talk about this on national television. And I'm sure every single person watching this now and listening to it will be feeling incredibly, incredibly emotional <laughs> at this particular moment. But that is the reality of the situation isn't it? And c can I just ask you if, you, if you're all right, just, just one more quick question, Lisa, which is, what do you want done in response to this? Because sadly, Lisa, there will be, well, up to 500 people a week, it would appear at the moment, in a desperately similar situation to you. And it's not just the patients who are the victims here, it's the family <laughs> members, isn't it, Lisa? What needs to be done, in yes. your opinion? So they need to... Going forward, they need to, you know, how many times are we told there's a shortage of GPs, they're suffering from burnout, 
They're retiring because of the pension plans that were put in place for them. They've got to see patients. When you get a call from a, a, a relative, a loved one that's saying, my husband, my wife, my son, my daughter needs to be seen face to face. You've got to see them. A GP has to see them. They are the primary carers. They are the gatekeepers to the NHS. Without them being seen first by a GP, there will be more, which is why we now seeing 500 people uh -huh. a week dying in NHS hospitals because they were denied the treatment and appointments that they needed. What my husband died from is a very, was very treatable. He did not uh -huh. need to die. He should never have died. And for every one of those 500 a week that are dying, there is a family behind them. There is a husband, a wife, a partner, a son, a daughter. And, and those children of those people that have died, it doesn't matter what age they are, they shouldn't be following coffins to crematoriums. It, it should, just should not be happening in 21st century Britain. Lisa, thank you very, very much. Just, just stay there for me, Lisa. I just want to bring in uh, David Lloyd, who is an NHS GP. David, look, I'm sure, like everybody else, you would have been incredibly moved by that. Now, Lisa was very, very eloquent there, wasn't she? I mean, this is the reality, David, isn't it, of, of the situation. As a GP, how does that make you feel this, that, sadly, in this particular case, you know, the lack of a face-to-face -face appointment, for example, or the lack of ability to get an appointment clearly leads to the situation that Lisa and her family find themselves in? I, 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 it's a, a very, very well put uh, argument and uh, no one in their right mind can say that face-to-face -face appointments are hugely important when it comes to diagnosing things like abdominal pain. So yes, absolutely, 100% agree with, with Lisa. The, the other figure that comes out uh, that we've known for some time is that one quarter of cancers are now diagnosed in the emergency departments. Mm. Uh, and by the time people get there with their cancer, they're very often, very often at a stage where you can't cure them. So uh, the, the, there are fundamental weaknesses in the NHS which would be great to get right. And that's mm. Lisa's story is, is absolutely a tragic one which should be widely publicised. Look, thank you very much. Uh, you're on screen now, so I'll thank you first. NHS GP David Lloyd. David, can I just say as well, I do really appreciate you coming on. I know that you and I have a bit of back and forth about a variety of different <laughs> issues, but I, I do uh, I do enjoy the little uh, jousting that we do have, and I think it's Good important there to finish on, the, on that note because uh, David Lloyd there did come on and at least actually propose a couple of solutions. Hey, if it is true, if it is true that we're in a situation right now where we cannot get enough funding to have homegrown doctors and at the same time we have a situation where doctors for example coming from the European Union are blocked whereas yes as people in my inbox GB views at gbnews.uk have already been making the comparison we don't seem too picky about who else we appear to let in from various different European countries that to me does seem like maybe we've hit on one key point of solution here already so far and that's our first topic of the day just want to say thank you very much again to Lisa King, the very brave lady you heard there, giving a harrowing testimony of her husband's sad passing. GBviews at gbnews.uk is that email address. You are with me, Patrick Christie's coming up. We're only just into 2023, and already the first migrants have Hi. crossed the English Channel. We can. What can the government do to stop it being another record year no, for the migrants? Before that, um, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking mostly dry and settled, but with a few showers in the far northwest. Here are the details. It will be a fine start to the evening across the southwest of England. The wind will be light and skies will be mostly clear, allowing temperatures to dip fairly quickly. The southeast of England will experience similar conditions with generally dry weather, no more than a gentle breeze and plenty of clear periods. The odd patch of cloud is possible near to the south coast of Wales, but it will be a dry early evening elsewhere with clear periods. A ridge of high pressure will be toppling across the Midlands from the west, helping to give light winds and a quiet early evening. It will be turning chilly though under the long cloud breaks. 
chilly too for the northeast of England, where skies will generally be clear. A bit more breeze is likely than further south, but temperatures will still begin to fall away. One or two areas of low cloud will drift across southern Scotland from the west, but it will stay dry with some clear spells. Northern and western Scotland might catch a shower. The breeze will gradually start to pick up across Northern Ireland heading into the evening, although at this point it will be dry and there will be some clear breaks. It will turn frosty this evening, especially in the east. However, wet and windy conditions will reach many areas from the west later. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Yes, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Patrick Christie's on GB News. Now, just before the break, and by the way, if you missed that, I would urge you to go back, look online, rewind it, or find a way of rewinding it if you're recording it on your telly or whatever you're doing, and just have a little listen to the wonderful Lisa, the very brave Lisa, who gave a harrowing testimony of her husband's sad passing. I don't want to say at the hands of our NHS, but certainly it was not helped by the care that her husband or lack of care that her husband got at the NHS, certainly when it came to that old chestnut, a face-to-face -face GP appointment. And 
uh, hundreds of you have been emailing in off the back of this. And I wanted to, before we move on to exclusive pictures, by the way, of the very first Channel Migrants of the year, which is another hot topic, another issue that a lot of you care deeply about. I just wanted to read a couple of these emails out. GBviews at GBnews.uk. Debbie says, I'd be interested to see the figures for annual and sick leave during this crisis. Soldiers had to cancel their leave to cover for the strikers. This in relation, of course, to NHS strikes. Ralph says, your strap line said health bosses call on the government to declare a major incident within the NHS. Surely this is the wrong way around. Shouldn't the government be calling on health bosses to do their job and sort out the NHS rather than deflecting the blame. Now, it's an interesting point, that, isn't it, Ralph? Because there is a lot of blaming going on here at the moment. And I wonder whether or not it's a little bit of six of one and half a dozen of the other. I, by the way, can absolutely believe the narrative that people have been going to the government who work in the NHS for the last 12 years and been saying, look, here are some solutions to some of the problems. People think about the NHS and they just think A&E. It's not. It's one of the largest employers in Europe, if not the largest. It's one of the largest employers in the UK. If you looked at it a little bit like a business, which is unfashionable to say, but you did, it is an absolute behemoth of a thing. And therefore, you have a multiple different layers of structural issues. And I can believe that these people have been ignored. But at the same time, I can't help but feel like it's entirely self-defeating to throw your hands up at the moment and to basically walk out on what is yet another crisis. And also, as well, what terrible PR. They talk about recruitment, don't they? They talk about retention. Anyone who's been watching the news for the last month, are you realistically going to tell your son or daughter to go into the NHS? No, because they've made it look like an absolute hellhole. Margaret says, it's worth pointing out the Scottish NHS is in just as bad a state as the NHS in England. I waited 10 hours in an ambulance and then a further eight hours in hospital to be admitted with breathing difficulties. One more, I think. Sarah says, why on earth are the highly paid NHS managers... What on earth are the highly paid NHS managers doing? Surely they are there to look for solutions to the current situation. There is far too much waste in our health service. Now, Sarah, I am keen to get solutions, not just problems today. One of the solutions obviously would be pay, OK, just because that anyone would want to be paid more. It makes people more inclined to be a, a medic or any profession. Pay is clearly a solution. I'm not convinced that's necessarily the solution, though. We also have an issue that was identified by our previous doctor, Dr David Lloyd. Now, yeah, all right, OK, bit of a Ramona, right? But at the same time, he did identify quite a critical point, which is that if we are not able to have enough doctors produced here through our own universities. Universities say they can't afford to do that, OK? I would question it, given the kind of cash system in universities at the moment, but fine. Then we should be able to have people coming from the European Union. There are our near neighbours. They're the people that we've traded with and lived with, etc. more closely, arguably, than any other part of the world. Well, apparently, now, it essentially is easier to get in a dinghy and come across the Channel and enter the United Kingdom than it is if you want to be a doctor in our NHS. And that, obviously, is a massive problem. The other thing, just to wrap up this particular NHS segment that I will say, is that when I look at junior doctor's salaries starting from around 29,000, working their way up to about the 60 mark, I look at nurses' salaries, I look at paramedic salaries, I look at all those people, and I look at directors of lived experience on 100, 150 grand a year, diversity officers on 100, 150 grand a year, and I think... How can people within the NHS, management within the NHS, justify that those people's jobs is three times more valuable than the bloke who's just stuck a defibrillator on someone who's just crawled out of a car crash and died on the side of a road? I don't really see how those two things can marry up. But anyway, we're moving on, people, to another story that's going to get you going, no doubt, because it's already started. We are just two days into 2023, and GB News can exclusively reveal that already... Dozens of Channel migrants have arrived in Dover after making that dangerous crossing. Last year saw a record number of migrants making that crossing, almost 46,000, the highest number in a year ever. It was bizarrely seen as a bit of a victory that we didn't hit the 50k mark, wasn't it, which is bonkers. Anyway, that means that the number of migrants illegally crossing the Channel in small boats has increased 150-fold over the last four years. Let that sink in. Last month, Rishi Sunak unveiled a series of measures aimed at curbing the crossings and tackling the backlog of asylum claims, including legislation to make it unambiguously clear that if you enter the UK illegally, you should not be able to remain here. But is all of this just talk? Haven't we heard all of this before? The former Director General of Border Force has told GB News that the government needs to get a grip. Tony Smith 
says that the government must introduce a detention and fast-track removal process to break the people smugglers' business model. We've also heard, haven't we, OK, so Rwanda, that scheme, that's not unlawful. There are even rumblings of disused cruise ships being used for the famous word offshore processing in the channel, so people might not actually set foot into the UK. Something like fast-track deportation schemes with Albania as well, a revision of the modern slavery slash human trafficking laws. Is it all starting to come together? I'm not sure. The proof will be in the pudding. Border force officers are now in France as well. This is another new one, patrolling with the French authorities to try and stop the crossing. So as of today, you can imagine how the French feel about this, by the way. As of today, there are UK border force officers, not the same ones who were on strike at your airports. No, these are different border force officers, right? They are on French beaches with French so they're equivalent. And apparently as well, they're in little rooms where they can monitor them coming across. But are they just there in some kind of advisory role? Does it actually do anything? Is it a kind of chocolate fire ground approach to what's been going on in the channel? But as our Home and Security Editor Mark White reports, authorities are planning for the possibility that twice the number that arrived last year could arrive this year. Just take a look at this. We've got some exclusive pictures in this as well. First time you'll see them. Heading into Dover Harbour, the Border Force vessel Defender, carrying dozens of mainly young men, pulled from the first small boat of 2023. Poor weather in the Channel prevented several other small boats from making it into UK waters. As around 40 people were taken away for processing by Border Force, official sources have told us they're prepared for another year of record high arrivals. It's prompted Tony Smith, the former Director General of Border Force, to call for a far tougher approach to dealing with the crisis. We've got to get into detaining people when they arrive here who are manifestly unfounded, abusing the system, detaining them only for a limited period, for as short as period as this. No one wants to lock people up for months and months, but, but get all the legal barriers, all of those dealt with really quickly under a detained fast track process and start seeing removal. We've done it before. We did it in the UKBA when I was there. We had a detained fast track process and we did deliver significant removals. And that's the best way of getting uh, control of this. The most obvious candidates for fast-track removal are the 13,000 Albanians who arrived on small boats last year. The UK government has agreed a new rapid returns policy with the government in Tirana, but so far only a handful of Albanian nationals who arrived across the channel have been sent back. Another key agreement in the government's plans to tackle the small boats crisis is the Rwanda deal. Although the High Court has now ruled the plans to process asylum seekers in that country are lawful, with the possibility of further court appeals, no flights have so far taken off bound for Kigali. It's taking about 450 days for that to be decided. Why can't those claims be decided within 28 days? Conservative MP James Daly, who sits on the Home Affairs and Justice Committees, believes, despite any obvious momentum, in the year ahead, Rishi Sunak's government has the right plans in place to tackle the channel migrant crisis. This is the moment where we can do something about it. The question which people will judge us on is should we have done that three years ago and, and sit the earth to where we are now. We knew this was coming, we knew these numbers were coming um, and it's, it, it's not acceptable but I can only be a politician now stood in front of you who says, I want to look forward, we've got the right set of ministers in place, we're going to deliver, in my view, having had talks with various ministers. And that's where I think we're in a good place at the moment to deal with it. Another one of Rishi Sunak's plans will see the creation of a new Home Office-led unit, bringing together Border Force, the military and the National Crime Agency to focus more effectively on tackling the channel migrant crisis. The establishment of a dedicated small boats operational command will see the arrival of hundreds more personnel here in Dover. But will it lead to a reduction in crossings? Well, critics suggest all it'll really do is ensure that small boats are intercepted and migrants are processed more efficiently. And for the year ahead, authorities are already quietly planning for up to double the number of last year's arrivals. For Rishi Sunak's government, it's never been more important that the various pieces of his plan to tackle this problem come together. A record number of crossings this year 
would be politically catastrophic. Mark White, GB News on the Kent coast. Right, OK, so that's what's taking place literally right now in the channel, by the way. Those pictures just dropped. They're the first channel migrants of 2023, supposedly. But Stuart Carroll joins me now. Now, Stuart Carroll is Conservative councillor for the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead. And he's raised the issue of migrants being housed in hotels in his borough before. But actually, it's the sheer cost of it, Stuart, isn't it? And this is what I want to drill down with you in now, which is people talk about how cash-strapped we are as a nation. We're seeing the videos come through there. How much is this costing you in your area, and is it sustainable? Happy New Year, Patrick, and happy New happy Year to your viewers. Um, you're absolutely right. This is not sustainable. Uh, this is a international and national catastrophe, and it's also a local emergency. As we've talked about previously, the impact on local government uh, from the... We, for example, just when we look at unaccompanied asylum seekers, that's young people under the age of 18. In our area alone, we've taken over 31. And that's cost us over a million pounds. That's a, roughly the equivalent of 1.25% uh, of council tax, which we're now having to look to factor into this year's coming budget. And it isn't just the direct costs, which, yes, government gives us some money for. It's the direct costs. It's school places, school transport, health visits, uh, social care, safeguarding, and none of that is factored in to the government formula, and that's why we've been calling for the radical change, but also for the government to take this much more seriously. Frankly, the government needs to adopt a New Year's resolution issue to be a lot sterner, robust, mm. and Stuart, look, thank you very much. I am afraid, unfortunately, the connection was a bit dodgy there, Stuart, so I'm very sorry. I'm going to have to drop it there, but I will talk to you again very soon on this, I'm afraid. Stuart Carroll there, who is Conservative Councillor for the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead. So we saw just around 46,000 people cross the Channel and arrive in the United Kingdom last year. All right. None of them were sent to Rwanda. Very questionable as to exactly how many of them were deported at all. We're seeing local boroughs, the royal borough of Windsor and Maidenhead there, just saying categorically, we are, well, it's just unsustainable that we can have our main hotels continually used by this. The money that the Home Office is giving us in order to look after these people is not enough because it doesn't just come down to hotel costs and uh, costs for them to eat, etc. obviously. It comes down to social care. And a lot of these people saying that they're children, which means they then go through the child services, which is, again, more money on top of all of that. And realistically, this is something I want to drill down on, which is the knock-on effects. And I want your views on this. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Today, we've seen the first British Border Force officers on the beaches in France. Start of 2023, start as you mean to go on, putting Border Force officers on beaches in France. France. I'm keen to know how the French feel about that, by the way. We've got Border Force officers supposedly going to Tirana Airport to try to stop some Albanian chaps coming over here and getting involved with the wrong crowd. We've got supposedly flights about to take off to Rwanda. Question marks over when that will take place. We're looking at a task force in the channel. We're looking at offshore processing with cruise ships. I want to know from you. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Do you think the number of people arriving via small boats across the English Channel will go up or down on last year's numbers. Last year, 46K. What's your prediction for this coming year? GBviews at gbnews.uk. You're with me, Patrick Christie, still to come. Conservative or Labour? Or you just don't know? Last year's political shenanigans have left voters feeling politically homeless. Could the red wall turn blue again or become a completely different colour? Stay with us. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. 
Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. OK, welcome back, everybody. I'm going to have to rattle through it now to the end of the hour. Lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on the migrant crisis. Time for just one email at the minute, though, unfortunately. Hazel says, why can't the border force do immigration checks on board the boats? And anybody with no proof of ID will be returned immediately to France. Well, I suppose, Hazel, although it's not a bad shout, sometimes the boats are sinking and also no one would have identification on them, really, would they? So they'd all go back to France. Hey, you know what? Plenty of people would be banging in favour of that. Hazel, but I think in practical terms, our border force probably wouldn't want to initiate it. The fingers crossed, though, today is the day. We've now got British boots on the beaches of France. Not for the first time. There's a joke in there somewhere. I won't make it. I'm better than that, OK? We've got British boots on French beaches, and supposedly now they're going to be keeping an eye on things and stemming the flow. 46,000 last year. I've been asking you, do you think we'll have more this year? I suspect we probably will. Anyway, think back to the last election. The Conservatives... They won big in traditional Labour voting constituencies, creating the so-called Red Wall, beating the so-called Red Wall. But now the Red Wall could crumble for the Tories, although the seats may not go back to Labour. A new poll suggests undecided voters could swing the next general election, with many saying that they're wavering on which way to vote. The Best of Britain campaign group that commissioned the poll says this... Since spring 2022, Conservative-leaning voters have been becoming wavering voters rather than switching to Labour. Wavering voters are overwhelmingly intending to vote. So it's still all up to grabs. Don't believe everything you see in the opinion polls that it's catastrophe for Rishi because, actually, people are still undecided. So what do you think? Do the Conservatives stand a chance at the next general election? Or if you won't vote Labour but you won't go back to the Tories... Who do you vote for? Let's now talk to political commentator Benedict Spence about this. Benedict, great to have you on the show. Happy New Year, my good man. I hope you had a good festive period. Uh, do you think that actually the Red Wall could still vote Tory or not? I think there's every opportunity that it could vote Tory. Um, I, yeah, I, I've never been sort of entirely set on the idea that it's all doom and gloom for the Tories, and the evidence for that is simply to look to what the Tories were polling at two years ago, and you can see that Boris Johnson was still riding high amongst uh, the general public. There's no reason that if it can collapse that quickly, it can't be regained, uh, perhaps not as quickly as it collapsed, but it can still be regained. I think that a lot of people would like uh, to believe in the Conservative Party. I think a lot of people uh, still have not quite forgiven Labour, especially in these traditional Labour heartlands. I don't think that they've forgiven them for uh, decades of decline and mismanagement and broken promises. Uh, just because there's been you know, sort of a, a subsequent period of decline and mismanagement mm. and broken promises from the Tories, I don't think means that people have uh, completely been won over by Keir Starmer. I think there's a lot of residual memory around uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I think that they can still see certain figures who were quite prominent during the Corbyn years uh, still at the front and centre of Labour Party politics. Ultimately, also, Keir Starmer isn't actually offering anything particularly barnstormingly no. new. He's offering this sort of quiet continuity, business as usual, but a little bit more sensible. I'm not sure that that's the bold vision that people voted for uh, for Boris Johnson uh, in 2019. And I don't think it's necessarily enough for them to sway away from the Tories, especially if Rishi Sunak in the next two years mm. can come up with some bold ideas. No, I think you're absolutely right. This country does need a bold vision because there are numerous different crises 
on the boil, as it were, and we do need someone who's not just a continuity candidate. Benedict, stay there, because I'm going to bring in William Atkinson, assistant editor of Conservative Home now. Now, William, I thought it was fascinating that Lee Anderson, apparently, was the top pick for the Conservative voters when it came to their, their MP of the year, backbench MP of the year. Now, Lee Anderson, a very straight-talking chap. He wants to sort out what's going on the channel. He is no nonsense. And that, to me, screams at what people actually want. And that is not on offer at the minute when it comes to... Wishy washy Rishi and Keir Starmer, Captain Hindsight, is it? I would disagree. I think oh. um, what we did with that poll was allow um, people who are part of our members panel to actually nominate an MP of their own choice rather than provide them with um, a, sele a sort of pre picked selection um, that we would have chosen. Um, and out of that, many different candidates emerged um, as people, uh, uh, as MPs that people have particularly liked over the previous year. Um, and Lee Anderson happened to take the uh, the most votes out of those, but it was a relatively wide, wide field. And I think also, um, as you were saying earlier, when you were touching upon the uh, crisis in the channel, um, Rishi Sunak has already outlined a series of policies um, to try and deal uh, with crisis. I think more are going to come in the next few weeks, and we could probably expect a big speech on it on some, at some point. Um, but the difference between, say, a backbencher like Lee Anderson is that he can make lots of very good headlines mm. um, and win over many of our panel members uh, by talking the talk. The problem is, um, in government, you actually have to walk the walk. And I think that is the thing that Rishi Sunak is struggling with at the moment. But I think from a personal perspective, he's got a much better chance of doing so than either Boris Johnson or Liz Trusted. OK, now, look, with both of you, I'll bring Benedict back on now. Um, with both of you, we've spoken a bit about a more bombastic personality with a slightly bolder vision. And I understand that, you know, the politics of personality is a big thing. But we've got what we've got. And realistically, Benedict, realistically, it's going to be Starmer versus Sunak at the next election, unless something absolutely unbelievable happens, I suppose. So let's just assume that's where we are. What does Rishi Sunak need to do to win back all those people in the middle at the minute who say... Well, I'm not really a Tory anymore, but I don't want to vote Labour. What are the policies he needs to put in action? I think you need to sort of get back to basics. I mean, the, the border crisis, the you know, the Channel crisis is certainly one of them. The inability of the NHS to cope with an ageing uh, population. Um, and also, I think the criminal justice system is another thing that needs to be taken into account. And the final thing is probably growth. And you can factor energy into that if you like. You know, these are the sort of the big ticket items, uh, health, security and money. And I think that they've been sort of gradually dripping away for a very long time. And what I think uh, Rishi Sunak has to say to himself and say to his party is, look, we've been saying for weeks and months now, it's not a question of if we lose the next election, it's by how many. Well, if you're starting from such a low base, why not be bold? Why not throw a Hail Mary shot yeah. and try and get some of the things that people have been asking us to do for 12 years? Why not use our 60-odd seat majority? is now about 55. Why not use that majority yeah. to try to get some things done so that we're not remembered as a limp laughing stock? Yeah, exactly that. And the word timid comes to mind and has done, frankly, since Theresa May, really, actually. And that is shocking. There was a little brief window of Boris, bombastic Boris, and then back we go again. Benedict, that's great stuff. Thank you very much. Benedict Spencer, political commentator. William, I think I've got time for one more with you quickly. William Atkinson, their assistant editor of Conservative Homers. Lost? No, we've lost him. OK, fair enough. No worries, because... Ah, come forth. Step into the fray. We've got GB News viewers... Uh, and this is Adam from Durham, I believe. Yes, there we go. Which is one of the key red wall seats which turned Conservative for the first time ever in 2019. Great to have you on the show, my good man. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Where are you at politically at the moment? Because I'm seeing this poll and it shows loads of people, millions of people are undecided. You know, I'm a Conservative member at the moment, have been for about seven years. Um, I think it's unlikely that Labour are going to win the sort of 500 seats that this poll projected the board. If you look at the undecideds, it's likely it's going to be a, a slim majority. But what's interesting is when you look at the undecided voters, the biggest group of undecideds are the over 65s. And what we know about the over 65s is that they're the most likely to vote. And when they do vote, they're most likely to vote Conservative. Mm. So I think it's I think it would be difficult at the moment to write off the Tories in the red wall. And it would also be interesting to see if a third party came forward, a reform UK perhaps, and if that was led by Nigel Farage come that election, would they be able to, to claw as many votes from Labour as they did last time round, which allowed the Tories to yeah. win in many of these seats? I mean, the, the depressing thing, Adam, is that we seem to kind of know what Rishi Sunak seems needs to do, which is, you know, obviously to do with the economy, to do with healthcare and to do with the channel. Just very quickly, Adam, very quickly, we've not got long now, why not vote Labour? I don't think Labour at the moment is clear on what it believes. I think the only thing Keir Starmer can offer at the moment is that he's not Boris Johnson, he's not Rishi Sunak, he's not the Conservatives. And 
I, I struggle to speak with anybody who can actually define Labour's platform. And no, I think I it's very easy to say what the Conservatives are doing and what they're doing wrong. But no. I think everyone's struggling to, to determine what are Labour's policies and what will they do to address all these crises that we're talking about. Adam, fascinating, isn't it, for a party so obsessed with identity politics, they don't seem to have one of their own. Adam, thank you very, very <laughs> much up there in the North East. That's going to be one to watch. Patrick Christie's on GB News. Plenty more coming up in this programme, including is the death of the high street imminent? Stay with me. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwir, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. You're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Coming up this hour as we try to get 2023 off to a flyer, GB News can exclusively reveal the first migrants of 2023 have been picked up, making the channel crossings. How can we stop them from coming? And is it the death of the high street? Almost 50 shops closed down every single day last year due to the cost of living, impacts of lockdown and soaring high inflation rates. But... Is there a light at the end of the tunnel for the humble high street? How's your high street getting on? Got all that and much, much more, including we're drilling down into the NHS crisis. I want solutions, not problems, people. And keep your views coming in. GB views at gbnews.uk. Do you think that the number of people crossing the channel is going to be higher this year or last year? And what can Rishi do to win your vote? Now it's headlines. Thank you, Patrick. Good afternoon. It's one minute past four. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. And GB News can reveal the first channel migrants of the new year have arrived at Dover Harbour. Dozens of mainly young men were picked up from a small boat around nine miles off the Kent coast. It's understood there were more than 40 people on board the inflatable boat that, as UK and French authorities, start patrolling beaches together for the first time in a bid to stop migrants from crossing the English Channel. Three people have died at the scene of a fire that broke out at a hotel in Perth. Police Scotland have confirmed 11 people have been treated for minor injuries. Emergency services were called to the new county hotel in County Place at around 5 o'clock this morning. Scottish Fire and Rescue say 60 firefighters were at the scene. In a statement, they called it a very complex incident. Health bosses are calling for the government to declare a major incident within the NHS over mounting pressure on the service. The Society for Acute Medicine has called the current situation urgent. 
The organisation NHS Providers, meanwhile, says the service is under the same levels of pressure as during the early stages of the COVID pandemic. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine claims as many as 500 people could be dying each week because of delays to critical care. The government says it recognises the pressure the NHS faces. Lisa King told GB News her husband would have survived if he'd been treated in time. 500 people a week dying in NHS hospitals because they were denied the treatment and appointments that they needed. What my husband died from is a very, was very treatable. He did not need to die. He should never have died. And for every one of those 500 a week that are dying, there is a family behind them. There is a husband, a wife, a partner, a son, a daughter. Well, meanwhile, it's been revealed some people are resorting to DIY medicine when they can't see a GP face to face. A recent survey commissioned by the Lib Dems shows more than one in four adults haven't been able to get an in-person appointment in the past 12 months. 16% of those who can't see a doctor have resorted to homemade medicine or asked someone not qualified to help them. The Department for Health and Social Care says it recognises the pressure GPs are under and is working to increase access for patients. Elsewhere, Ukrainian authorities claim around 400 Russian soldiers have been killed after a missile strike in the occupied Donetsk region. Officials in Russia dispute the figure, saying around 60 died in the attack. Neither claim has been verified. It follows President Vladimir Zelensky uh, saying his country's forces shot down 45 Iranian-made drones fired by Russia last night. Actor Jeremy Renner is being treated for serious injuries after an accident with a snowplow. A publicist for the 51-year-old says he's in a critical condition but considered stable. The details of the accident are still unclear. The two-time Oscar nominee is best known for his performances in The Hurt Locker, The Town and for playing Hawkeye in the Marvel movies. The wake, of, uh, the wake for Brazilian footballing legend Pelé has started at the stadium of his former club, Santos. Fans started to gather last night near the Urbano Caldeira Stadium, Pelé's hometown club, for the mass 24-hour public wake. These are live images if you're watching us on television. The three-time World Cup winner died on Thursday at the age of 82 after battling colon cancer for just over a year. Prince Harry says he wants his father and brother back in an interview to be televised days before his memoirs released. ITV says the interview with the Duke of Sussex will go into unprecedented depth and detail about his life in and outside the royal family. A preview clip shows the prince saying it never needed to be this way. And former tennis star Martina Navratilova has been diagnosed with throat and breast cancer. The former world number one previously underwent treatment for early stage breast cancer back in 2010. The 66 year old says the new diagnosis is a double whammy and serious but still fixable. Her representatives described the prognosis as good. And we wish her all the best. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now, though, it's back to Patrick. OK, pretty simple itinerary for this hour. Health, the migrant crisis, the high street. Let's start with health. It's a crisis in A&E departments across the country. That's what the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has said. Rising cases of both flu and COVID are putting added pressure on the NHS and the boss of the Royal College of Emergency Care says reports of 500 people a week dying due to delays in emergency care are, quotes, more than a guesstimate. A new research as well shows one in four people have bought medicine online or at a pharmacy to treat their illness themselves after failing to see a GP. We spoke to a GP earlier on. He was basically saying that there are a few issues at play there. Money for GPs. Part of the issue is as well that we are apparently not allowing many of our European GPs to actually come in at the same time as not training enough of our own. I can believe 
all of that. I find it absolutely stunning that we had a record year in the channel and we can allow all of those people in. But when it comes to, oh, I don't know, a French doctor, apparently that's a lot more difficult, but there we go. Let's talk now to Matthew Lash, who's the head of public policy at the Institute for Economic Affairs. Matthew, great to see you. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. All of that. Happy yes, New Year. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Right, OK, talk to me. How do we fix this particular crisis in the NHS? I'm sick of problems, Matthew. I want solutions. You're my man. Talk to me. Well, geez, Patrick, if, if there was easy solutions to the NHS, I think they would have long since been seen. What, what we're seeing um, generally in the NHS is quite depressing. It's, it's people waiting days to be admitted, people lying in cor corridors, people screaming, including children screaming, in emergency rooms. It's confronting, it's worrying, but sadly, absolutely nothing new. It, it, every winter, there is an NHS winter crisis. This is not normal. This is not universal. Not every country manages to have a healthcare system that struggles under strong pressure every single winter. Um, and it speaks to a broad issue with the NHS, which is we put more and more money into the system. We've got record amount of funding, more doctors and nurses than, than a decade ago, uh, something like 40% extra funding since 2010 in real terms after considering inflation. And yet right now, the NHS is struggling in uh, what is effectively efficiency, which is um, it's not doing as many operations, it's not seeing as many patients, it's not treating people um, for, for what's wrong with them. Now, this does seem to speak to a fundamental problem in the NHS, which is it is a highly monopolistic, highly bureaucratic, one-size-fits-all system that's inevitably struggling under increased pressures um, yeah. and needs more structural reform. Now, Matthew, whenever I get now a uh, junior doctor or a nurse or someone on, I always ask them what they're paid, and then I'll say to them, do you know what a director of lived experience is paid or a diversity manager or one of that squishy middle ground of people who, let's be honest, are usually on between 100 and 150 grand a year? And I'll say to them, do you think they're really worth three or four or five times the amount of your salary? And I am staggered by the fact that they always refuse to answer that question. It's almost like they don't want to go after their own because they also work in the NHS. But actually, are those people the problem, not necessarily the government? Yeah, look, I, I think there are fundamental managerial problems at the heart of the NHS. Obviously, there's people being hired for, for what many would consider fake jobs, not necessarily adding a substantial value in the NHS. At the same time, though, you have a lot of doctors and nurses who complain that, in fact, we've underspent on middle management, that, that, that they have to spend a lot of their time filling out paperwork rather than actually treating patients. So one of the issues, of course, is the government consistently says, well, we're putting more money into the front line, we're going to mm -hmm. cut back middle management, the NHS proportionally actually has relatively few managers compared to private sector organisations or other healthcare systems. Um, and so therefore, we've ended up leaving doctors and nurses doing bureaucratic nonsense rather than actually training patients. I think that's one of a gazillion issues um, in the NHS. And it's, it's structural and fundamental. It's hard to fix these efficiency problems when you have such a top-down system where the government will jump around with different priorities. And we're going to get another, another plan for the NHS shortly. Um, and I'm sure yeah. it's going to have about as much success as the others because it, they're not actually reforming the underlying structures that have led the UK to have a worse healthcare system than Germany or France or many other Western European countries. I find it amazing that this country, we locked down to protect the NHS. People lost their jobs to protect the NHS. People developed catastrophic mental health problems and actually became more ill themselves to protect the NHS. And now, get a load of this, some chap in Wales is telling us to not go for a long run, because if you go for a longer run, it will increase the chances of you ending up needing an ambulance. I suppose it very much depends on where you're running or how you're running. But there are serious questions now about whether or not the British public have a duty to take extra precautions with their day-to-day -day life so as to not overburden the NHS. Now, obviously, I don't go base jumping as a matter of regularity. I don't do... Except, I don't bullfight and things like this. I don't do exceptionally dangerous things. But at the same time, I might like to go for a long run without having to think about our NHS. And I'm just wondering... Is it time, Matthew, that we had a conversation as a country about whether or not we want to dedicate the vast majority of our public's expenditure into a health service? Is that what we need to have? Because we have to have a choice now, don't we? We either do that or we don't. Yeah, look, Patrick, as someone who went for a, a bit of an extended run this morning, How perhaps dare I should you? be feeling... <laughs> Absolutely shocking. Go on, carry on. <laughs> Um, how dare I indeed uh, try to take care of my own health? Quite quite bizarre. I mean, I find it quite um, disturbing, I think, in, in the same way that you're suggesting, which is a healthcare system exists to serve us. We don't exist to serve a healthcare system. And I understand people sacrificed 
perhaps rightfully so in terms of you know social contact during COVID, not to potentially give the disease to elderly people or yeah. to put you know not necessarily put the same bet on the system. But at the same time, we put so much money into this healthcare system. I think I think you're getting the central point. I mean, there's no issue with a wealthy society as it's aging, uh, as there's more burdens and, and more, uh, in fact, more technology behind healthcare that, that the system can purchase to put more money into healthcare. I think that's that's a kind of a good social. Um, outcome that we mm. want there's no issue necessarily with funding healthcare the question is about how we fund it the uk is pretty unique in the fact that it's basically all it's it's taxpayer money um goes to the nhs rather than having any kind of patient choice patient control of that money you know we have relatively little choice within the nhs about how we spend it we, we discourage effectively from getting private health care because not only have to pay for the nhs we also have to pay additional amounts for that private care so the, the way the system is structured is is completely wrong in terms of encouraging people to take responsibility or patient choice within ah. the system because it's so monolithic. That's it. Just sorry, I know you've got to go, but just very quickly, because you've hit on a key point right at the end there, which is about people taking responsibility. Now, at the moment, is it too easy for people who work in our NHS, management level I'm talking about here, who underperform or who are rubbish at their job to blame it on the government? Because if that's the case, would privatising it actually give them nowhere to hide? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a pretty classic uh, behaviour in public sector organisations, which is it's very hard to fire anyone, very hard to deal with um, people who aren't performing up to their their abilities and aren't necessarily delivering um, for the system. And inevitably, that that will encourage a, a culture of laziness and inefficiencies. I mean, everyone maligns profit, but profit is the outcome of getting uh, efficiently delivering something to people. Yeah. It's it's the profit you receive on getting us that fruit and vegetables at the at the supermarket at a low cost. You know that that is efficient. And that's what the NHS is lacking. It doesn't have a price mechanism. It doesn't have the normal incentives for um, yeah. good outcomes, which we see in, in the private sector. Matthew, thank you very much, as ever. Matthew Lesh there, Head of Public Policy at the Institute for Economic Affairs. Let's cross over now to Theo Chikomba, who's at Stoke Mandeville Hospital in Aylesbury. By the way, thank you very much, everyone, who's getting in touch on this. GBviews at gbnews.uk. I've got a mixture of NHS horror stories and some solutions of your own, which I will go to. But, Theo, what's the situation there? Is there an increasingly dark Stoke Mandeville hospital in Aylesbury? Yes, so the number you quoted a few minutes ago, around 500 people uh, potentially dying uh, every week, uh, is a you know a figure that paints a stark picture of where the NHS is at the moment. This hospital here at Stoke Mandeville is one of around a dozen hospitals which have declared a critical incident in the last few weeks during this festive period. And their concern leading up to today particularly is uh, around the long bank holiday weekend with how many patients are going to be coming into their hospital. Now, we've heard from the government in the last few weeks, particularly talking about uh, double-digit pay rises, saying they're not in a position to do that. And the Prime Minister has been consistent by saying they're not going to be offering that. And But they do understand the, the struggles that the NHS is going through at the moment. In terms of where do we go next, it's, uh, it's difficult to see what happens next. We know the strikes are coming up in the next few weeks. But of course, the challenges remain here, as they're saying they need more finances at the moment. They're also struggling uh, with staff as well, um, but also long-term investment to ensure that we don't find ourselves again having winter pressures and the sea, the NHS bosses come out and say they need more support. Yeah, thank you very much, Sir Chikomba. They're reporting to us from Stoke Mandeville Hospital in Aylesbury, at least at roundabout near it. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on the NHS crisis. Glenis says... The non-important management jobs in the NHS should be cut. And, Glennis, this is a key point. I will keep banging on about this. I'll keep asking it to everyone who works in the NHS who comes on this show, which is why, oh, why, can you... How, oh, how, I should say, can you justify people on 150 grand a year to monitor whether or not they need to put a rainbow-coloured roundabout outside or rainbow-coloured anything, frankly, somewhere in the NHS, whether or not the NHS is ethnically diverse enough or whether or not they can have nice little educational days about tolerance and inclusivity on 150 grand a year when you've got a nurse there on 25 grand if that desperately saving people's lives how can they justify that is this not actually the management's fault anyway glennis goes on to say an independent auditing company should go into hospitals and investigate their finances i have no doubt they would show that incompetent management is to blame for the financial mess the nhs is in well it's hard to disagree with that in a sense because if we are pumping more money into it and the figure that makes people who are on picket lines very uncomfortable is that in real terms funding for the nhs has gone up 39 percent since 2010 now all right wages haven't okay and i do understand that and i am sympathetic towards that but the quality of output 
hasn't been good either, has it? If you were running a business, which, let's be honest, we might as well call the NHS a business because, in a way, it is, then, actually, you would not be happy with the results that you were seeing from the NHS. Therefore, it needs fundamental change. But, unfortunately, it appears to be a bit too much of a political issue to actually do anything about that. I can't help but wonder a couple of things, totally self-defeating all of this wow, wow, wow about the NHS from the people who work in it. Every single year, at this time, every single year, the NHS is in crisis. The NHS is overflowing. People have got colds. People have got flu. Now, of course, they've got a little bit of COVID as well. Every flipping year, A&Es are overflowing and we've got a crisis with ambulances. So, look, forgive me for not being massively sympathetic about this particular crisis because, you know what, I've got deja vu. But the idea that NHS staff, as bad as it may be for some of them, keep piping up and going, it's terrible, this is shocking, I'm quitting because I'm going to have some kind of epic health catastrophe. Well, hang on a minute. Were you doing anything to entice people into it? I don't think it's particularly good PR, is it? Karen says, we need to get GPs to see patients. This would save us going to A&E and pick up on issues before they become acute. GPs also need to be paid per patient treated, not per head registered at their surgery. Well, I don't claim Karen to be bang across exactly the minutiae of the details of how GPs are paid, whether or not it's paid per patient or per head at the surgery, whatever it actually is. So I'm not going to delve into that. But what I will talk to you about is that we need GPs to see patients. I am sick and tired of people. We had... Lisa on earlier on, and it, it was a deeply emotional interview. I would urge everyone to go back and have a little look at that. Lisa, bless her, her husband sadly passed away. It was the old classic, wasn't it? Getting misdiagnosed off one of these, off a phone or off a laptop, and relentlessly, and it turned out in the end, unfortunately, he got desperately ill, he collapsed, he died, right? And we're hearing now about poor care or delays to treatment. I would call it poor care. It's non-care, isn't it? Non-care, really, so catastrophic care. Delays to treatment, costing around 500 people their lives every single week. That's an estimate. But that's just 500 people who die. What about the people who don't die, who don't get good enough care? What about the people who are the loved ones of those people who passed away? Their lives are probably never the same again, either. It is a catalogue of people whose lives are shattered. And a lot of that starts with an inability to get a face-to-face -face GP's appointment. And I'm sorry, but I don't think there's too much excuse for it now these days. GPs, it used to be an incredibly attractive career. We all know why, OK, because of the money and because of the retirement fund, etc. And the ability to go private, that can't all have changed so recently, can it? GBviews at gbnews.uk. Coming up, the first migrants of 2023 have arrived. GB News can exclusively reveal what's on the back of a record number of migrants crossing the channel this year. What can the government do to stop it becoming yet another record year? But before that, it's the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking mostly dry and settled, but with a few showers in the far northwest. Here are the details. It will be a fine start to the evening across the southwest of England. The wind will be light and skies will be mostly clear, allowing temperatures to dip fairly quickly. The southeast of England will experience similar conditions with generally dry weather, no more than a gentle breeze and plenty of clear periods. The odd patch of cloud is possible near to the south coast of Wales, but it will be a dry early evening elsewhere with clear periods. A ridge of high pressure will be toppling across the Midlands from the west, helping to give light winds and a quiet early evening. It will be turning chilly though under the long cloud breaks. Chilly too for the northeast of England where skies will generally be clear, a bit more breeze is likely than further south but temperatures will still begin to fall away. One or two areas of low cloud will drift across southern Scotland from the west but it will stay dry with some clear spells. Northern and western Scotland might catch a shower. The breeze will gradually start to pick up across Northern Ireland heading into the evening, although at this point it will be dry and there will be some clear breaks. It will turn frosty this evening, especially in the east. However, wet and windy conditions will reach many areas from the west later. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, wonderful people. Now, we're just two days into 2023. Already, dozens of migrants have been picked up trying to cross the English Channel. That's despite Border Force now patrolling the French beaches. So, good start, lads. Good start. The small boats, they just keep on coming. Now, a record number of people crossed the English Channel in 2022. It was just shy of 46,000. It's the largest number ever in a year. This means that the number of migrants illegally crossing the Channel in small boats has increased, and this is the standout figure... 150 fold over the last four years. Last month, Rishi Sudak unveiled a series of measures aimed at curbing the crossings and tackling the backlog of asylum claims. These included legislation to make it unambiguously clear that if you enter the UK illegally, you should not be able to remain here. Should not be able to is different to won't, isn't it, though? But we've heard it all before, haven't we? The former Director General of Border Force has told GB News that the government needs to get a grip. Yeah, OK. Tony Smith says the government must introduce a detention and fast-track removal process to break the people smugglers' business model. But as our Home and Security Editor Mark White wonderfully reports, authorities are planning for the possibility that twice the number could arrive in the year ahead. Just quickly, I want to know from you, do you think we will have more or fewer crossings in the year to come? GB Views at GBNews.uk. Some exclusive pictures here of the first migrant arrivals of 2023. Take it away, Mark. Heading into Dover Harbour, the Border Force vessel Defender, carrying dozens of mainly young men, pulled from the first small boat of 2023. Poor weather in the Channel prevented several other small boats from making it into UK waters. As around 40 people were taken away for processing by border force, official sources have told us they're prepared for another year of record high arrivals. It's prompted Tony Smith, the former Director General of Border Force, to call for a far tougher approach to dealing with the crisis. We've got to get into detaining people when they arrive here who are manifestly unfounded, abusing the system, detaining them only for a limited period, for as short as period as this. No one wants to lock people up for months and months, for, but, but get all the legal barriers, all of those dealt with really quickly under a detained fast track process and start seeing removal. We've done it before. We did it in the UKBA when I was there. We had a detained fast track process and we did deliver significant removals. And that's the best way of getting uh, control of this. The most obvious candidates for fast-track removal are the 13,000 Albanians who arrived on small boats last year. The UK government has agreed a new rapid returns policy with the government in Tirana, 
But so far, only a handful of Albanian nationals who arrived across the channel have been sent back. Another key agreement in the government's plans to tackle the small boats crisis is the Rwanda deal. Although the High Court has now ruled the plans to process asylum seekers in that country are lawful, with the possibility of further court appeals, no flights have so far taken off bound for Kigali. It's taking about 450 days for that to be decided. Why can't those claims be decided within 28 days? Conservative MP James Daly, who sits on the Home Affairs and Justice Committees, believes, despite any obvious momentum, in the year ahead, Rishi Sunak's government has the right plans in place to tackle the channel migrant crisis. This is the moment where we can do something about it. The question which people will judge us on is should we have done that three years ago and, and sit the to where we are now. We knew this was coming. We knew these numbers were coming. Um, and it's, it, it's not acceptable. But I can only be a politician now stood in front of you who says, I want to look forward, we've got the right set of ministers in place, we're going to deliver, in my view, having had talks with various ministers. And that's where I think we're in a good place at the moment to deal with it. Another one of Rishi Sunak's plans will see the creation of a new Home Office-led unit, bringing together Border Force, the military and the National Crime Agency to focus more effectively on tackling the channel migrant crisis. The establishment of a dedicated small boats operational command will see the arrival of hundreds more personnel here in Dover. But will it lead to a reduction in crossings? Will critics suggest all it'll really do is ensure that small boats are intercepted and migrants are processed more efficiently? And for the year ahead, authorities are already quietly planning for up to double the number of last year's arrivals. For Rishi Sunak's government, it's never been more important that the various pieces of his plan to tackle this problem come together. A record number of crossings this year would be politically catastrophic. Mark White, GB News on the Kent coast. Mark White there. Right, well, joining me now is Henry Bolton, international security and border control expert. Henry, thank you very, very much. I've got to ask you straight out the traps. Do you think there will be more channel crossings this year than there were last year? Uh, I'd say there are going to be at least as many, most mm. probably more, yes. And the reason I say most probably more is because we're seeing an increase in the number of migrants that are preparing to cross the Mediterranean and come in from southeastern Europe. So... Uh, you know, and of course, a proportion of those are going to be heading our way. Yes, mm. so the, the pressure is going to build. Absolutely, Patrick, yes. OK, all right. And it, again, this is despite, in your view, despite the fact that we've now got Border Force officers on French beaches, British boots on French beaches, as you were. We've got people supposedly in some kind of task force who might have offshore processing with a cruise ship off the coast. We might have people going to Rwanda. Despite all of that, you think we're going to have more, which implies to me that we need to cut the head off the snake and go after these people smuggling gangs, do we? We, we need to hunt down these people smuggling gangs. We across along the entire route, not just on the French coast, not just on our border. We need to interdict this at every conceivable and op opportunist point along all of those routes. That's a big effort. We have the planning capability to do it, but the Home Office doesn't want to know. Tony Smith, who you referred to earlier, former DG of Border Force, he and I have been discussing this. Absolutely, he's 100% right. We need to reinstigate the detention and the returns uh, pra practice that we had years ago. The governments and successive governments, in fact, Tony Blair started the process, dismantled what we had in place, both the upstream disruption and the actual returns, detention and returns process we had at the time. We need to bring those back. And Patrick, Tony Smith is a unique man in that he, he gr came up all the way through the ranks of the immigration service from the bottom all the way to the very top to, to become director general. I've helped 14 different countries at cabinet level to sort out these sort of problems. It's time the Home Office started listening. And if they don't know how to do it, if Suella Braverman or Rishi Sunak doesn't know how to do it, Tony and I are standing by and we keep telling them this. We will come in. They don't have to listen or they don't have to agree. They don't have to follow our advice. But they're there are two people there who know how to do it. We've done it before.
They have not. If they want to succeed on this, it's a matter of will, determination and knowledge. They don't have the will, they don't have the determination and they certainly don't seem to have the knowledge. OK, all right. I mean, the, you obviously have put forward your case for this now, and it is a combination of different things. And one of the main ones there is increasing detention and therefore deportation as well. Do you think the Home Office has gone woke? Not necessarily to Ella Braverman at all, but the people behind her, and that's why we're not getting to grits with this. There is no I think that's, will. That's largely the case, I think, Patrick. It's very, I'm very sad to say. I think they simply do not believe that this is the right thing to do. Mm. But, you know, I, I'd, I'd ask them this question. You know, when we've got the world's population plus of 8 billion now, we've got the population of Africa increasing. OK, do they really expect us to have open borders? Mm. You know, not even the European Union is doing this. OK, they're, they're accepting about 2 percent of applications from Albanians. We're accepting, well, we're accept, in terms of accepting the applications, just about 100 percent of them. We're accepting mm. close to 60 percent um, in terms of granting them. This is a this is a country that that nobody nobody accepts applic asylum applications from. It's mm. madness. But I think you're right, Patrick. We've got a civil service in the Home Office, which okay. quite frankly does not get they it. Don't want They're to not know. on our team, Patrick. No. They're not no. on our our team. They want open borders, but their job is mm. to manage and secure borders uh, according to what politicians demand of them, yeah, not I, to do their own thing. I'm going to have to leave you there, Henry. Thank you very much, though, as ever. Henry Bolton, their international security and border control expert. I have had conversations with a couple of Home Office insiders, actually, over the festive period, and I've been absolutely terrified by what it appears their priorities are. There appears to be a lot of woke stuff, a lot of the old gender ideology, not a lot of closed borders. So there you go. You're with me, Patrick Critties, on GB News. After the break... Is the death of the high street a real thing? Almost 50 shops closed down every day last year. Good grief. Due to the cost of living, impact of lockdown and soaring high inflation rates. So, what will the high street look like in 2023? What is your high street look like, actually? Has it got better? Has it got worse? But first, though, it's your latest headlines. Good afternoon. It's 4.34. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. The first Channel migrants of the new year have arrived at Dover Harbour. GB News can reveal that dozens of mainly young men were picked up from a small boat around nine miles off the Kent coast. It's understood there were more than 40 people on board the inflatable. It comes as UK and French authorities start patrolling beaches together for the first time in a bid to stop migrants from making the treacherous crossing. Three people have died at the scene of a fire that broke out at a hotel in Perth. Police Scotland have confirmed 11 people are being treated for minor injuries. Emergency services were called to the new county hotel in County Place at around 5 this morning. Scottish Fire and Rescue says 60 firefighters were at the scene. In a statement, they called it a very complex incident. Health bosses are calling for the government to declare a major incident within the NHS over mounting pressure on the service. The Society for Acute Medicines called the current situation urgent. The government says it recognises the pressure faced by the NHS. But the Royal College of Emergency Medicine claims as many as 500 people could be dying each week because of delays to critical care. And former tennis star Martina Navratilova has been diagnosed with throat and breast cancer. The former world number one previously underwent treatment for early stage breast cancer back in 2010. The 66-year-old says the new diagnosis is a double whammy and serious but still fixable. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Patrick will be back in just a moment. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay, believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back, everybody. Now, the High Street, OK, once was a thriving, prosperous district in your local area. What does it look like now, though? Because almost 50 shops closed down every single day last year as retailers struggled with soaring energy costs, critical inflation rates and online shopping. The figure is almost 50% higher than 2021 and marks the highest number of closures in the last five years. Our GB News Yorkshire and Humber reporter Anna Riley is in Hull for us now. Anna, what you got? Good afternoon, Patrick. Well, it's not so much of a happy year for the high street, is it, with those figures? The Centre for Retail Research has found that 17,145 shops closed in England in 2022. That's impacted 1,000... Uh, sorry... 100,000, more than 100,000 retail jobs and this was an increase of 45,000 from last year and here in Hull it's the most empty shops in Britain and that was a survey by Property Inspect. They found that Hull has 26 empty shops per 100,000 people compared to the national average of six and I'm here on White Frigate. It was once a bustling part of Hull in the old town but now on this street like you can see the shop behind me the closed half the shops on this street are shut and I went out speaking to shoppers about what they had to say. My wife has a cafe on the in the arcade just from the corner and she's been there for 30 years and the rents have tripled quadrupled and they get no help with anybody they get no help with parking or anything else i'm actually old-fashioned i prefer to go to the shop and actually see a product and buy it whereas my son he'll do it online has dropped she did pick up again at december but then what's it going to be like in january I mean, I've just walked through and there's lots of clothes, not just white forget, all over the town. So it's like, wow, it's dying. Ah, the good people of Hull there. Anna, thank you very, very much. Thank you for bringing us that. I'm standing outside on a high street in the cold as well. Anna Riley there, our Yorkshire and Humber reporter. Well, joining me now on this quotes and quotes death of the high street stuff, anyway, is personal finance expert and founder of moneymagpie.com. It's Jasmine Bertels. Jasmine, thank you. I'm concerned that our high streets are just going to end up like big clone towns. You're going to have the same row of shops on every single street. You're going to have your Greggs, your M&S. If you live in a posh part, you might have a Waitrose. If not, it's probably just a, I don't know, Lidl or something. And it's all going to look the same, every single town. But then it's been like that for a while, let's be honest. You know, you could go into pretty much any town in Britain and you, you would have known the kind of shops that you would see. It's just that now you see about half of them. And what bothers me, frankly, is the, the posh areas. So, for example, central London is really sad. Um, if you go to Oxford Street, half the shops are empty or they've got those sort of, you know, really tacky touristy shops, which is kind mm. of the same as being empty, in my view. Um, you go to, to Knightsbridge even, you know, these, now that, I think, is, is a sign of a really, really worrying sign. Okay, but 
Is there any incentive now for people to open up these little boutiques? I mean, the only boutiques I can imagine that have opened recently is the kind of footballers' wives jobbies that you see popping up around the Golden Triangle in the Cheshire area. I mean, what's the incentive for people at the moment? Business rates are going up, you've got you know, rent going up. Is there any point taking a punt on your own business? Well, very little. And, and as you say, and, and as uh, one of the interviewees said, the rents have absolutely skyrocketed. Uh, business rates are a nightmare. And also parking. Again, I mean, I know one or two people who are running their own shops. And parking is a big thing, as well as um, the, mm. the business rates. And, you know, government after government is not dealing with the business rates issue. And then you've got local local councils making it very difficult for people with cars. Um, so there's there's very yeah. little, time, little possibility. And what I think is really worrying, and we've seen this particularly over the last three years, is essentially a, a, a shift of money from small... I wouldn't say necessarily poor people, but small, struggling small businesses, um, lower middle class, if you like, middle class, of the, the middle types mm. and the, the working class, money being taken for them and being given to big corporations. I yeah. mean, Amazon's doing phenomenally well in this. You know, thank you very much. I, I, I find it really, I find it really, really upsetting, actually, that the mm. likes of your Marks and Spencer. Look, I'm not knocking Marks and Spencer. If I to think, I might be wearing an MLS suit now. Actually, but I'm not knocking Marks and Spencer's, but yeah, you know, they're they're everywhere, okay, and they do well because they can buy up these bigger properties as well or rent those bigger properties on the high street. But there appears to me, Jasmine, to be a startling lack of imagination from both big government and local government, which is the well, OK, we apparently now have to turn everywhere into a crippling one-way system and absolutely no parking. Mm -hmm. Charge people to high heaven if you want to park for half an hour. There's a traffic warden on every single corner. We are about unemployment yeah. rates. There's definitely no unemployment with traffic wardens, is there? The amount of tickets, I'm collecting them like Pokemon cards at the minute. It's shocking. <laughs> Just for stopping, even at a red light, and waiting for someone to slap a ticket on my car. And then you got that, and then also they go, all right, well, this building's empty now. Let's put housing in it. Now, I'm all for town centre housing, but it's not a town if it's just houses now, is it? It just seems like there's no imagination. Absolutely. And, and it is a problem, I think, long term for property and the general wealth of that area. For example, I went um, to Bournemouth uh, a few months ago with a couple of friends of mine who are property developers. And there's a lot about Bournemouth that's great. You're on the sea, there's some lovely houses and everything. But we went into the town centre and it's just completely hollowed out. But barely anything, barely any shops there, a few restaurants. It's really sad, literally sad. It makes you sad to look at it and to wander around it. Now, I think that's partly because there's, there's probably some out of town big shed. You know, again, that's a real problem. I think these these big out of town places, which hollows out the, the, the main towns. So it meant they thought, nah, not going to bother, not going to buy here. They'll, mm. they'll go somewhere else. And this is going to be happening all around the, the, the country. People going, well, it's nice, but, you know, where do you go for your, for your milk and wh where, are the, where are the shops, where are the nice shops, nice places to go? And they're not there. I think, Jasmine, it points to a wider issue, which is the fundamental death of community. We've seen it, especially in rural areas. Now, second home ownership, I'm not knocking anyone who wants to have a second home, by the way. I mean, I'm way off the mark, but goodness gracious me, the second I can afford to own somewhere in the Lake District, I'll be bang there. But, you know, you've seen it, the death of it now because people aren't there, so the local shops go. and It's just, if you, it's nice to have the option, isn't it, to go out to your local shop, to know the person in the shop. But I don't know, Jasmine, maybe we just lost that bit of Britain. It does. It, well, it feels like it. I, I do agree. And I think we, we've lost things like, you know, the, the local church, the, the local church community used to mm. be the heart of things. Plus, of course, the pub. So you go to the church, then you go to the pub. Pubs are having a problem. Churches, again, talk about hollowing out. You know, there, there is a big problem there. And then there does, you know, I mean, this sounds like conspiracy, but mm. it feels like there's been an attack on the family, the concept. It, there has of been. The yeah, no, no, it doesn't feel like it. That absolutely has been. The, the, the death of the nuclear family will lead to more problems in this country than arguably anything else. Mark my words, that's not an exaggeration. Because it, it no, does... I... I, I'm sorry, and people... I had a Labour MP on the other day who told me... who genuinely looked me in the eye and told me that the idea of fatherless homes was not a particularly bad thing. OK, all right, you, so, it's, so it's preferable, is it, to have a single parent? Not knocking people who are single parents or anything like that. I'm just saying it's obviously preferable if you've got two parents. Oh, Jasmine, I'm going to have to go. Sorry about this. Jasmine Bertels from moneymagpie.com. 
there and a uh, personal finance expert. Yes, the death of the high street people. I think it points to a much wider issue. It's the death of community. It's the death of a lot of... Very British thing, I think. It's not very British, is it, to walk, drive down into a rural area and you just see, you know, an M&S and a Greggs and whatever, a Primark. You know, we want a bit of independent shops. Anyway, lots of you have been getting in touch. With your thoughts on the warnings that migrant crossings could double this year, John says... The law is the problem. They want 46,000 individual court cases to decide if they should stay or go. What a joke. Well, I suppose... The, look, I do get your overarching point there, John, but I think the issue is that it's 46,000 individuals, isn't it? Neil says, unless Britain leaves the ECHR and makes it illegal to enter Britain across the Channel illegally... Yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, then we will continue to see increased numbers crossing the Channel. We should make it 100% clear. Anyone crossing the Channel illegally will not be allowed to stay, regardless of circumstances. One more quick one. Jean says, the worst part is that we are actually facilitating these crossings by making the RNLI and Border Force into a taxi service. That is a national scandal. There's lots of this that are a national scandal, not least the amount of money that we're having to pay every single day. I am sick and tired of reporting about how overstretched we are. By the way, we're not even allowed to say that legal immigration is a bit too high in this country at the moment. Hearing the NHS, the public services, everything, left, right and centre, is under too much pressure, housing, all of this stuff. No one is allowed to link that to how many people that we allow into this country every single year, because apparently that's wrong, despite the fact that that is literally driving a lot of the crises that we face ourselves with right now. Anyway, tomorrow should be the first day back to work after the Christmas break, but many will opt to work at home, as one once again, the rail network is brought to a standstill by strikes. Members of the RMT union at uh, Network Rail and 14 train operators will stage two 48-hour walkouts from Tuesday and Friday, while train drivers in Aslef, the union there, will strike on Thursday. So the town of Barnstable in North Devon is expected to be cut off entirely by the strikes. Good grief. Bad day for Barnstable. Our South West reporter, Jeff Moody, is there. Jeff, I'm concerned that you won't be able to leave. <laughs> I'm all right because I've got my car. And actually, to be honest, Barnstable is a pretty, uh, is a four by four place. So not a lot of people use the train, but uh, there is going to be no service here at all. And uh, over the whole of the country, we're affected. It's the, you know, we're all back to work tomorrow, but not if you're going by train. Two 48 hour strikes, one tomorrow and one on Friday there from the RMT. But right in the middle of that, slap bang in the middle, is a strike by Aslev, the train drivers union. That's on Thursday. Thursday. So no chance of getting a train really throughout this week. There will be a 20% service, we're told, in places running from 7.30 in the morning till 6.30 in the evening, but that's only in places. Uh, a lot of people I've been speaking to today have been saying, you know what, I'm going to stay home for another week. I'm going to extend my Christmas break, which is great, but it's not going to help industry very much, is it? It's not going to help the economy if we're all just sat at home because we can't get to work. Well, um, what are the, the major players in this dispute saying today? Well, the rail delivery group says no one wants to see these strikes go ahead and we can only apologise to passengers. Great. Well, as left, they've issued a comment. They've said we don't want to go on strike, but the companies have pushed us into this place. Mick Lynch has said... He really wants to talk, he really wants to arrange a deal, but he needs to get a deal on the table. The government need to come up with an offer for him to then put to his members, and until they do that, he says there's nothing he can do. And uh, finally, we're also told from the Department for Transport, they're saying passengers have rightly had enough of rail strikes and want the disruption to end. Well, speaking to people here, there's still a broad support for the RMT, but there is a sense that that support is starting to wane uh, and people really do want the disruption to end. Jeff, thank you very, very much. Jeff Moody there, who's been reporting from Barnstable. He's our South West reporter. Right, well, let's go to my next guest, who's on this very topic now. He's political commentator Suzanne Evans. Suzanne, thank you very much. I'm just going to read you a couple of bits and bobs that I've got here in front of me. We're hearing about the never-ending cycle of train strikes. I did read with some interest over the weekend that now some of the unions are concerned that basically their members are going to go skint and the unions might go skint themselves, and therefore they want some kind of general strike to try to have one big hammer blow. The rail strikes cost our economy, the hospitality sector alone, £1.5 billion in December alone, which I think is kind of like uh, 
economic terrorism, really. And then I read this headline. Train staff pocketed £154 million in bonuses in a decade on top of generous salaries when all 27,000 of Networks Rail signal and track maintenance staff were included, some of whom will be striking, by the way. £207 million was paid out. It's absolutely remarkable, this, isn't it? Should they be banned from striking? I think what we have here is the problem that uh, a lot of the media doesn't report those kind of figures, Patrick, that you've just read out. So people, the general public is not aware of this. They're not aware of the huge amounts of subsidies, for instance, that went into the railway system during uh, COVID lockdowns. Uh, 42 billion taxpayers are shelled out now. We're even in normal times looking to be shelling out 11 billion in the 22... 23 year. So massive amounts of public money goes into the railways. And I don't quite know where the unions think additional money is going to be coming from. And I think it does t tie into public sympathy. How much more is the public going to put up with this for, to be honest, particularly those working class people that haven't got access to cars and who are the most affected by these strikes and are not going to be seeing anything like the kind of pay rises that the rail workers are demanding. Um, yeah. You talked you, about the whole hospitality industry. Yeah, I think uh, UK hospitality is saying they think uh, that sector is going to lose 200 million just this week because of the five days of strikes that are going on. Um, it's bad for workers. It's bad for the economy. It's bad for Britain. And I wonder, Suzanne, when it comes down to this question, when you see the numbers involved there, and we're in a cost of living crisis, everyone's skint at the minute, we're paying through the nose for what's going on the channel. We seem to have an open blank checkbook for Ukraine, for goodness mm. sake. I wonder whether or not, when it comes to banning strikes, something I'm morally opposed to normally, under normal circumstances, I think people's right to strike is important. But if it was phrased as a different question, which is, should people have the right to cost our economy billions of pounds a day? I reckon that the public sympathy for these striking workers would diminish quite rapidly. Yeah, I think you're probably right. And I think there's also a point where the rail workers need to think, how self-defeating is it going to be for me to carry on not going to work? Um, you know, already we're seeing an increase in work from home. We've had that during the pandemic. Yeah. People are still working from home now. Uh, it's driving people away from the railways. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, th I, th I think it's, it's self-defeating. We know that Rishi Sunak is looking at banning strikes or at least putting severe restrictions on strikes in essential public services. And this is only going to fuel that impetus in Parliament. I mean, we're hearing now that he's potentially going to bring in legislation this month. Hey, all right. And um, look, thank you very much, Suzanne. I've talked, I think I've just got time for one more very quickly. Sorry, just very, very quickly. What would your message be to ASLEF? Because as I understand it, they're more in control of the, the train drivers. And also, as I understand it, they can be on around 60 odd grand a year and the rest. Do you think that they should be striking? No, I, I don't think they should be. Uh, and I think, as I said, it's also self-defeating, particularly for oh. them, because one of the other things, of course, that the rail networks want to do is bringing an increase in driverless trains or driver-only trains, so effectively more work for them. So I think the longer they push this, actually, the more likely they are to find themselves out of a job. Yeah, and, and just very quickly, actually, sorry, Suzanne, just very, very quickly, do you think the government's just wait it out? Because we are hearing reports that actually, realistically, if these people are going on strike because they are skint in the middle of a cost of living crisis, with respect, they're not going to have that much money to stay on strike, are they? I don't think I think the government's got any choice. It's drawn a line in the sand. We have a stalemate here. We've had the Department of Transport today issuing a statement saying that we can't do it. It's going to increase debt. It's going to fuel inflation and it's going to cost taxpayers an extra thousand pounds each if we give in to their demands. I think the government has laid a line in the sand and I don't yeah. think it's going to be prepared to step over. Absolutely. Suzanne, thank you very much. Political commentator, the wonderful Suzanne Evans there. Interesting point. Of all of this for everybody at home or listening on your radio, get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk. All right, you might be in favour of strikes, you might be in favour of the workers and all of that stuff. Are you in favour of anyone being allowed to cost our economy, even just one sector of our economy, billions of pounds in a month? Are you in favour of that? Because to me, that seems a little bit rum, given the fact that we're all supposed to be in this together. I'm not sure that's on the side of the workers, is it? Everyone in the hospitality sector suffered. You're with me, Patrick Christie. There's plenty more coming up very, very shortly, including the latest on the Harry and Meghan scandal. The gloves are off. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking mostly dry and settled, but with a few showers in the far northwest. Here are the details. 
It will be a fine start to the evening across the southwest of England. The wind will be light and skies will be mostly clear, allowing temperatures to dip fairly quickly. The southeast of England will experience similar conditions with generally dry weather, no more than a gentle breeze and plenty of clear periods. The odd patch of cloud is possible near to the south coast of Wales, but it will be a dry early evening elsewhere with clear periods. A ridge of high pressure will be toppling across the Midlands from the west, helping to give light winds and a quiet early evening. It will be turning chilly though under the long cloud breaks. Chilly too for the northeast of England, where skies will generally be clear. A bit more breeze is likely than further south, but temperatures will still begin to fall away. One or two areas of low cloud will drift across southern Scotland from the west, but it will stay dry with some clear spells. Northern and western Scotland might catch a shower. The breeze will gradually start to pick up across Northern Ireland heading into the evening, although at this point it will be dry and there will be some clear breaks. It will turn frosty this evening, especially in the east. However, wet and windy conditions will reach many areas from the west later. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back, everybody. It's Patrick Christie's on GB News, and it's five o'clock. Lots coming up in today's programme. The first migrants of 2023 have crossed the channel. Will this be another record-breaking year? I suspect so, despite all of this that we keep hearing from this government. And will you be reading Harry's book, Spare? I imagine it will make cracking firewood as a nice drawing. He started his publicity blitz with two bombshell interviews, but is there anything new in what he has to say? But all of that coming your way. Also, a big deep dive into the broken NHS. I want to hear from you. GB Views at gbnews.uk. I want you to tell me whether or not you think there'll be more or fewer channel crossings this coming year. GB Views at gbnews.uk. But now, it's your headlines. Thank you, Patrick. Good afternoon. It's one minute past five. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. 
The first Channel migrants of the new year have arrived at Dover Harbour. GB News can reveal that dozens of mainly young men were picked up from a small boat around nine miles off the Kent coast. It's understood there were more than 40 people on board the inflatable boat. It comes as UK and French authorities start patrolling beaches together for the very first time in a bid to stop migrants from making the treacherous crossing. Three people have died at the scene of a fire that broke out at a hotel in Perth. Police Scotland's confirmed 11 people have been treated for minor injuries. Emergency services were called to the new county hotel in County Place at around 5 this morning. Scottish Fire and Rescue says nine fire engines and up to 60 firefighters were at the scene. Health bosses are calling for the government to declare a major incident within the NHS over mounting pressure on the service. The Society for Acute Medicines called the current situation urgent. The government says it recognises the pressure faced by the NHS. But the Royal College of Emergency Medicine claims as many as 500 people could be dying each week because of delays to critical care. Lisa King told GB News her husband would have survived if he'd been treated in time. 500 people a week dying in NHS hospitals because they were denied the treatment and appointments that they needed. What my husband died from is a very, was very treatable. He did not need to die. He should never have died. And for every one of those 500 a week that are dying, there is a family behind them. There is a husband, a wife, a partner, a son, a daughter. Meanwhile, some people are resorting to DIY medicine when they can't see a GP face to face. A recent survey commissioned by the Lib Dems shows that more than one in four adults hasn't been able to get an in-person appointment in the past 12 months. 16% of those who can't see a doctor have resorted to home remedies or asked someone who isn't qualified to help them. The Department for Health and Social Care says it recognises the pressure GPs are under and is working to increase access for patients. Actor Jeremy Renner is being treated for serious injuries after a snow ploughing accident. A publicist for the 51-year-old says he's in a critical condition but considered stable. The details of the accident are still unclear. The two-time Oscar nominee is best known for his performances in The Hurt Locker, The Town and for playing Hawkeye in the Marvel movies. Thousands of mourners are gathering to pay their respects to Brazilian football legend Pelé, who's lying in state at the ground of his former club, Santos. Fans started gathering for the public wake last night at the Urbano Caldeira Stadium in Sao Paulo. The three-time World Cup winner died on Thursday at the age of 82. He'd been undergoing treatment for colon cancer. Tomorrow, there'll be a procession through the streets of Santos, followed by a private family burial. Prince Harry says he wants his father and brother back. In an interview to be televised just days before his memoirs released, ITV says the Duke of Sussex goes into unprecedented depth and detail about his life, both in and outside the royal family. A preview clip shows the prince saying it never needed to be this way. And former tennis star Martina Navratilova has been diagnosed with throat and breast cancer. The former world number one previously underwent treatment for early stage breast cancer back in 2010. The 66-year-old says the new diagnosis is a double whammy and serious but still fixable. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Patrick. Welcome back, everybody. Patrick Christie's here on GB News. Now, it's action-packed at the top of this hour, OK? We are squeezing in A&E, NHS and the latest from the people smuggling gangs and what's going on in the channel, including a French voice, because, actually, we have got British boots on the ground on the, on the beaches of Calais. So, A&E departments across the country are in a complete state of crisis.
It's that time of year again, ladies and gentlemen. Says the head of emergency medicine, rising cases of both flu and, yep, you guessed it, COVID, are making the situation worse. A number of hospitals have declared critical incidents, meaning they cannot function as usual due to extraordinary pressure. So, all of this is coming amid reports that 500 people a week are dying due to delays in emergency care. Anyway, to lend us his expertise on this topic is oncologist and favourite here at GB News is Dr Carol Sikora. Dr Carol, why on earth are reportedly 500 people a week dying as a result of not getting good enough care in our NHS? What's going on? So, Patrick, there's no doubt there are excess deaths, probably around 500. The exact cause is not clear. Whether it's clogging up in the emergency room, whether it's not being able to get an ambulance, whether, more likely, it's due to a whole load of things that are, you know, causing the NHS to go into free fall at the moment. I mean, it is, you know, I've been a consultant 50, well, 40 years now. I've been qualified 50 years. And there's no doubt I've never seen it quite so bad. Um, things have to be done. You know, I read in the papers about the government should declare an emergency. What's that going to do? do yeah. you, everyone can declare what they like. They've Look, got to Carol, do Dr. something, not declare it. Dr. Curry, you've hit the nail on the head there. There's two big things that I'm sick and tired of hearing. More money... OK, and let's just declare an emergency. Well, the money doesn't appear to go anywhere. It's a bottomless pit. It's been 39% increase in real terms in funding since 2010. We've got absolutely naff all to show for it, apart from apparently loads of excess deaths. And then when it comes to, as well, uh, declaring an emergency, I mean, all right, OK, it's a state of emergency. Let's all panic. I want practical solutions, Dr Carroll. Give them to me, please. Fix the NHS. <laughs> I can give you a 10-point plan. The trouble is no one would like it. And that's the whole problem for the politicians. They know anything they do to touch the NHS, which has been free for a whole generation of people and completely free, including things that you say really don't have to be done within the NHS, you should perhaps have to pay for. This is all free. People abuse it. And this is the problem we've got now. It needs a complete radical rethink. All solutions that come up are unpopular, whether it's charging for appointments, whether it's actually uh, fining people for not pitching up when they cancel it without cancelling an appointment, whether it's uh, calling for an ambulance when they're really not at all ill, abusing the system. It's all happening every day. Uh, more money, as you rightly say, would make no difference. There's about 200 billion every year going into our health care. Put another 10 billion in, it sounds great. A political vote winner, but what are you going to do with it? Just sustain the broken okay. system We've got to All change right. it. If Just quickly, Dr Carroll, now, are we in a situation where our NHS is so bad that people who can afford to have a duty to go private? They are, and uh, they're doing it because they can't get into the system. I mean, there are three drivers for the whole thing, and it's everywhere in the world. Aging mm. populations, mm. your health care costs about five times less than someone of my age. So mm. you can see, as you get older, you require more health care, more older patients, we've got problems. The second problem we've got is that the technology is fantastic. It's expensive, though. It's my business, cancer. You know, the cost of mm. treating a cancer has gone from about... £15,000 for a, a way back 20 years ago to about £50,000. So that's another demand. And then, of course, consumerism. People use things, they go onto Google, they see things they want, and they use it. And that's okay. another problem. Yeah. I, uh, Dr Carroll, look, thank you very, very much. Sorry it's short and sweet, but our viewers and listeners will find out why in a second because we've got to rip through the remainder of this show. Oncologist there, Dr Carol Sakura, desperately trying to fix our beloved NHS. There we go. Right, OK, I think a lot of people will be disappointed, though, that realistically, right now, what you would be expected to do is pay your taxes until the day you die and you'll have to pay into a service that, frankly, will not serve you in your hour of need. But we're moving on, people, we're moving on, because we're hardly into 2023. Already, GB News can exclusively reveal that dozens of migrants have been picked up attempting to cross the English Channel. 2022 was a record-breaking year for migrant crossings. Almost 46,000 people made it in 2022. This means the number of migrants illegally crossing the Channel in small boats has increased... What a figure. This is, people, 150-fold over the last four years. British Border Force officers are now patrolling French beaches for the first time. That's right. But will it change anything? We thought 
Let's go straight to the source. And we've only gone and pulled it off because with us now is, is French journalist Anne Elizabeth Moutet. Thank you very, very much. And might I just say, looking very, very glamorous as well. Fantastic. You'd love to see it. Talk to me about whether or not it's going to make a difference having British boots on French beaches. Firstly, how do the French feel about it? Oh. Uh the French don't mind. I, I don't think it's created any kind of sort of strange reaction. To be honest, uh, there's a disconnect between whatever policies are taken in France and the majority opinion of the French who do not like uh, the sort of in control migrations into France. I think last year uh, we had something like 180,000 migrants uh, sort of uh, without papers, uh, uh, without visas um, allowed into the country. And if you think that's popular, I should say two thirds of the country huh. aren't happy with it. Yeah. There are polls to back me up. So they, to some extent they understand. Uh, the presence of British police doesn't bother people so much. Uh, you know that at any control to go into Britain anyway, you have border control forces mm. uh, already so that if you take, say, the train at Gare du Nord to Britain, you pass both French and British passport lines. And that way, when you get there, there isn't a clog up when you leave the train. And, and that's something that's been completely understood. The situation in Calais, the one thing that you hear from the French from time to time is to say, look, why do the British make things so attractive to migrants in terms of benefits and help and, and legal provision? Uh, that make that mm. Britain attractive than France. That's fascinating. Talk to me about that then. So even French border force officers are perplexed as to why Britain makes itself so attractive for people coming across the Channel. I can't speak for the policemen, although I've spoken to some policemen about the general situation, and what they do say is uh, that not only uh, are uh, those poor people sort of brought there by people traffickers and then go there, but then they are being helped by um, uh, NGOs who are called no borders and who have a political agenda. Yeah. And if you, if you speak off the record to cops who do not want to uh, not show neutrality, they are deeply bitter about the fact that the NGOs, whether it's boat in the boats in the Mediterranean picking up those dinghies or whether it is in places like Calais, uh, there, is, there is a help that is basically a driven by an ideology that says that there should not be any borders between, between countries. Yeah. Uh, but the police themselves and the French in general say, why is it so attractive? And you've got to take a few things into account. For instance, if these people come from countries where they speak English, it makes perfect yeah. sense that they need to stay in France. Um, and, and sometimes and often they've got relatives and people from their communities already in Britain, and they know that they will find something. The second thing is something that is our fault more than yours, which is that the uh, unemployment in Britain is half what it is in France. Yeah. And so they know that they will find jobs. Um, mm. There's also the fact that in Britain, people are not supposed to carry papers on them. Uh, but other than, you know, having taken all this into account, uh, some of the things we realize that unemployment is our fault, the rest is uh, housing, uh, uh, health. That is the thing where they say, uh, well, you know, we understand why they go, we don't like it. No, I, and I, I'm very glad to hear you say that because it's about time someone came out and just said it. I have been, I, I can understand that French potentially are not necessarily, don't feel as though they're in control of exactly the amount of people who are coming into their country. I can also understand why they might feel as though they're more in control of people leaving their country, i.e. crossing the channel, and why in some cases they're quite happy to wave them through. And I think it's fascinating to find out straight from the horse's mouth, once for a better phrase, and of course, that actually they're not surprised to see that NGOs are making it so delightful for them. And Britain itself is rolling out the red carpet. And I'm going to have to leave it there, but thank you very much. French journalist Anne Elizabeth Mutet there, just saying what we were all thinking. And I'm joined now by former Brexit Party MEP Ben Habib and UK immigration lawyer Harjak Bangal. Thank you very much. Ben, you heard it there. The, even the French now, we've got British boots on French beaches. Even the French are scratching their heads going, why, oh, why did the British make it so attractive? these illegal immigrants yeah she didn't talk about obviously you know the benefits that they get in terms of health free dentistry mm. cash in their pockets four-star hotels and the rest of it and the other thing she didn't touch on is that our entire approach to border control is delivered through the prism of deterrence um, through deportation and of course to deport someone you effectively have to let them in in the first place a deportation as our policy response is a response to failure in the first place. Mm. And, 
you know, you look at the deal that we've got with the French, which puts our British boots on, on their shores and another hundred French Coast Guard, um, uh, another fr- 100 French policemen. So they've, they've increased the police force from 250 to 350 in return for which mm. we've given them 63 million quid, which is an yeah. increase of 13 million pounds from last yeah. year. Um, but that's not where the problem is. The problem is these dinghies trying to get into British territorial waters. The deal we needed to do with the French, if we're going to give them such an extraordinary amount of money, was mm. to allow British border force, British Navy and RNLI, who seem intent to get involved in this, to actually pick up the migrants and deliver them back to French ports. If the French are in good faith, why will they not let British boats take French... Uh, well, they don't. What, they, yeah. migrants straight back... But they don't, they don't want them, do they, Ben? And I think that's part... I get, I get exactly what you're saying, right? And I'm in agreement with you. But realistically, I mean, if you were... If I was French, I have to try to put myself in their, in their shoes. I might not be in but control what that tells of... You, Who's what coming? Who's coming into my country? But like, I am in control of who's leaving it, and it does. Ben, part that thought. Ben, Ben, part that thought for a second. I'm just going to go over to Harjap now. Harjap, thank you very much. I'm just going to get your take quickly, Harjap, and then elaborate however you want. Do you think we're going to see more or fewer channel crossings in this coming year, and why? Look, there's plenty of talk, Patrick, about this, and we talk often about it, but no one's mentioning the fact that. Who profiting from this? The gangs. Who puts these people on dinghies? The gangs. Who supplies the dinghies? The gangs. Whose benefit is a boat coming across? It's what every boat is worth two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to the gangs. If there's four boats in the ocean, that's a million pounds. Now yeah. they don't care whether people die or not, right? Well, they don't care about the British border force. They don't care about the French um, navy. What we've got to do is stop the gangs. All of this money and this effort we're putting into Rwanda, paying the French, why can't we just do a deal with the French and say, let our elite units on there and let us catch the gangs, or let's do a joint operation and catch the gangs? These gangs are operating from the same place, Calais, and sending people to the same place, to coast of Kent, for the past 20, 25 years. And are we trying to say that these same people using the same okay. routes, sending the same group of people over, and we right. don't know who they are, despite all the intelligence we have, Interpol, MI5, and mm. everyone that we have, we can't catch these gangs. Yeah, if you've got to stop that. drug dealing, it's you've a, got to lock up the drug dealers. You want to stop people trafficking, tra- bang up the people traffickers. Yeah, I, look, I agree. Harjap, thank you. Now, time for one more very quick one each chat because we're pressed for time here. Ben, Harjap's hit the nail on the head there. You spoke about deterrent. That's a failure. Surely the success of it all is biff off all this window dressing and actually go after these gangs. It's madness that we don't know who they are and where they are. Well, sad, I mean, he, uh, that's absolutely right. Go after the gangs. But sadly, that also requires French cooperation. And as you say, the French have a vested interest mm-hmm. in actually n- exporting the problem to the United Kingdom. What we've got to do is take unilateral British action in the absence of cooperation that clearly isn't working. We've got to stop these boats at the point of our territorial waters, and we've got to push okay. them back into, into French waters, and they must not be allowed to land. Certainly, Border Force should not be acting as a free taxi service for mm. illegal migrants entering the United Kingdom. OK, fair enough. Harjap, just one more with you now. I, look, I, I, to be fair, I'm just going to ask a, a bit of a similar one to the one I did before, which is we've had 46,000 in the last... Yeah, and people were annoyed that the Rwanda flies didn't take off. In your legal esteemed view, yes, I get that it's not much of a deterrent, so I don't want to ask that. Do you see that uh, any flights are actually take off, or do you think the law will hold them up again? There might be a token one that goes off, sends about 10, 15 people yeah. out there. It's not... 200 spaces is not going to deter 50,000 yeah. people crossing a year. We're, we're not going to see this co- going down until the gangs are stopped. That is the end, end of it. That's the end game. Stop the gangs. I mean, this is it. Look, chaps, thank you very, very much. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Brexit Party MEP, former Brexit Party MEP, Ben Habib, and UK immigration lawyer Harjab Bangal there just reacting to, well, the latest. It was a record year last year for the migrant crisis in the Channel. I suspect there's going to be another record year this year, although with it there might be consequences now because actually Rishi Sunak has put so much of his political clout on sorting this out, as has, of course, Suella Braverman. If they don't do it, then what next? Frankly, it's a capitulation, isn't it? We've got British boots on the ground in France right now. We're going to have British boats, of course, in the water as part of a task force, more so than there already are. We'll have to see whether or not anything actually takes place. We exclusively revealed that dozens of people have already made the journey so far this year. You're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Still to come, Conservative or Labour? Or just don't know? Last year's political shenanigans have left voters feeling politically homeless. I know a load of you feel politically homeless. You keep telling me about it every day. Could the red wall turn blue again? or become a completely different colour. I want to find out what it would take 
to get your vote. What would our politicians have to do to get you to vote for them? I will find out after the short break. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking mostly dry and settled, but with a few showers in the far northwest. Here are the details. It will be a fine start to the evening across the southwest of England. The wind will be light and skies will be mostly clear, allowing temperatures to dip fairly quickly. The southeast of England will experience similar conditions with generally dry weather, no more than a gentle breeze and plenty of clear periods. The odd patch of cloud is possible near to the south coast of Wales, but it will be a dry early evening elsewhere with clear periods. A ridge of high pressure will be toppling across the Midlands from the west, helping to give light winds and a quiet early evening. It will be turning chilly though under the long cloud breaks. Chilly too for the northeast of England where skies will generally be clear, a bit more breezes likely than further south but temperatures will still begin to fall away. One or two areas of low cloud will drift across southern Scotland from the west but it will stay dry with some clear spells. Northern and western Scotland might catch a shower. The breeze will gradually start to pick up across Northern Ireland heading into the evening, although at this point it will be dry and there will be some clear breaks. It will turn frosty this evening, especially in the east. However, wet and windy conditions will reach many areas from the west later. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Hey, welcome back to the first show of 2023 for me. I hope it's a wonderful year for all of you. I had a lovely festive period and lots of you have been getting in touch. I can tell there's more bums on seats today because that inbox has popped right off. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Andy says, I'm concerned about where we are going to put all of these people. He's talking about people crossing the channel. Soon there won't be any hotel space left in Britain. Now, Andy is reacting to a story we've been covering here on GB News throughout the course of this show, we had exclusive footage of the fact that the first group of Channel migrants crossed from 2023. We've got British boots on the ground in France. British Border Force are accompanying French Border Force or gendarmes or whatever they are on the beaches of Calais. It remains to be seen what difference they make. It's interesting, though, that now we enter 2023 in a slightly different space than we enter 2022 when it comes to Channel crossings, OK? So we enter it with, yes, a record year behind us, but with a, it would appear anyway, a determination to get the flyers to Rwanda to take off, however many of those remains to be seen, 
The talk of an offshore processing centre, i.e. a cruise ship in the channel, OK, fine. A task force in the channel, no, not the RNLI or the Border Force, some kind of other task force in the channel. British boots on the ground on French beaches and, as well, anyway, supposedly British people in the old uh, French Border Force viewing offices, right? So that's where we are at the minute. Hotels pretty much full. Taxpayers sick and tired having to fork out millions of pounds every single day to look after this lot. Talk of disused student accommodation or holiday camps, etc., being used. So, and we now, crucially, have a Prime Minister who said he's going to clear the asylum backlog by, well, now. This time next year. So by now, this time next year, I should be sitting here saying Rishi Sunak has achieved his goal and that he has actually cleared the asylum seeker backlog. If not, I wonder whether or not he really has to go. I suspect we're going to hear some sob stories to why he couldn't do it. And there we are. But this is why I want your prediction. Do you think, ladies and gentlemen, that we will have another record year in the channel? Because if we do, then frankly, there's only one solution in town for me. We cannot keep window dressing with all these things I've just spoken about there. Hotels, offshore processing. No, we've got to send the SAS in to get these human traffickers slotted. Anyway, Rishi Sunak's New Year message was designed to cheer us all up and make us all feel as though it's all under control. Apparently, some of his aides say that he's zen-like. Well, that's nice, Rishi. Cheers. I mean, the country's on fire, but as long as you're zen-like, did it work? Was it a start to make inroads into the Labour lead in the polls? But a new survey suggests, and this is interesting, undecided voters could swing the next general election, with many saying they're wavering on which way to vote. Many of those in the red wall appear to be reluctant to return to Sir Keir Starmer's Labour Party. I'm not surprised. But does Rishi Sunak have what it takes to win over those red wall voters? I think... There's a lot of people there who are in the don't know category. With me now is psychotherapist Lucy Beresford. Lucy, thank you very much, who's here to explain how can Rishi win over red wall voters? What would Rishi Sunak have to do? As we see now, the polls suggest that millions of people are undecided. It's all to play for. What does he have to do? What he has to do is he has to remember how people come to choose to vote in a particular way. And what they really do is they tell themselves a narrative about their life. Do I feel better off? Do I feel fitter? Do I feel happier? They tell themselves those stories about their own lives, but also about the lives of their loved ones and of their immediate circle. So if there are people in that circle who are not feeling safer or healthier mm. or feel like they've got enough money in their pocket, then people are going to start to feel bad about themselves and they're going to look for somebody to blame. Who is responsible for that? So when Rishi Sunak and even the opposition as well, when they're thinking about what policies to put out there and what narratives to put out there, it's about trying to present a vision that will make people feel better about their lives in the future. And that's a yeah. really complicated message to put across. It's not very clear because you're really trying to project into the future. And human beings are famously quite bad about thinking about the future. They are. But it was what's interesting here, and Jane summed it up, Jane's emailed in, she says, the, the guy asked people what they wanted to do, what Rishi could do to win their vote. She goes, properly exploit the opportunities of Brexit, sort the channel crosses out and overhaul the NHS. Sadly, though, I'm not sure that either party will do any of those things. And that, I think, Lucy, sums it right up. I think people just do not believe that our politicians are going to do anything. They've been lied to time and time again and they've not seen action. And that just breeds apathy. How on earth does Rishi Sunak convince voters that this time, this time, I promise you, it's different? <laughs> It's a very difficult message when you are part of the government that has been around for a long time, because it's harder to say, I'm going to do something different, because then that begs the question, how come you haven't done anything different before now? Clarity of message is very important. So as your caller identified, those three things are probably very clear, which is why politicians can get seduced into thinking that it's a good idea to put it on a pledge card or to put it on a stone, that actually they think that voters want that clarity. But actually what voters really want is a sense of vision. They want to feel, how do I feel right now? And is there going to be the possibility that I will feel better? And that's one of the things that Boris Johnson was able to do in 2019. A lot of people didn't trust him. A lot of people didn't necessarily trust the message, the mm. content of it. But what they really fell for was the delivery. What they wanted exactly. was optimism. People don't want the doomsters and the gloomsters, exactly. as he put it. They want to be sold a vision. Uh, you know what? It will be one of my eternal, great, unanswered questions of what could have happened with Boris 
if we hadn't have had COVID? And unfortunately, we'll never know the answer to that, but I think a lot of people will be wondering about that. Lucy, quick one, final one. What will it take for people to actually put a big cross in that polling booth next to a party they never voted before, i.e. a new party or something like reform, for example? People will have to break the voting habit of a lifetime. It takes a bit of cojones to do that. They don't traditionally do it, do they? They don't, but we did see an awfully big shift in that pattern of behavior in 2019. So for a lot of people, they will already have held their nerve and made a difference, made a, a, a different tactical vote, perhaps, or a different vote to the one that their family had uh, deployed in the past. So it can be done. It's very much about the vision. What vision am I selling the electorate? And that's why it's not really about the personalities so much. People talk a lot about whether people like Richard or do they like mm. Keir Starmer? Do they think he's wishy-washy? But actually, what they want to know is, am I going to feel better than yeah. I do now? It is about, about feeling. Lucy, I've really enjoyed that. It's insightful stuff, actually. Thank you very, very much. And can I say, talking of visions, where you are now looks absolutely wonderful, actually, I must say. It's even a, what looks like a sun, a sun lounger in the background. I'm very, very jealous. I'm locked here in Paddington. But thank you very much. Lucy Beresford there, who is, of course, a psychotherapist, who is there to explain how Rishi could possibly win over the Red Wall. That is in relation to the fact, ladies and gentlemen, that a new survey has shown that millions of people are in that squishy, undecided bracket. Enough people to swing the next general election. So forget what you're seeing in a lot of the polls about where Labour... Look, Labour are ahead. There's no doubt about that. But realistically, when it push comes to show, of election day, gun to your head, who do you vote for? A lot of people are fundamentally undecided. I wonder whether or not a lot of you are just not going to vote. And I wouldn't blame you. I know people fought and died for our right to vote, but I wouldn't blame you because at the minute, I've got to ask serious questions about what the living heck you're voting for. Anyway, you're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. After the break, it's a new year, same old strike. So rail passengers will face fresh travel disruption this week. But what is this disruption actually costing our economy? I think it's almost like economic terrorism. The hospitality sector alone lost £1.2 billion in December. Ah, but get a load of this, though. It turns out there have been, they've been record numbers, record numbers of bonuses for people working in the rail sector in the last decade. Who would have thunk it? But now, though, it's your latest headlines. It's 5.33. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. The first channel migrants of the new year have arrived at Dover Harbour. GB News can reveal that dozens of mainly young men were picked up from a small boat around nine miles off the Kent coast. It's understood there were more than 40 people on board the inflatable boat. It comes as UK and French authorities start patrolling beaches together for the first time in a bid to stop migrants from making the treacherous crossing. Three people have died at the scene of a fire that broke out at a hotel in Perth. Police Scotland's confirmed 11 people have been treated for minor injuries. Emergency services were called to the new county hotel in County Place at around 5 this morning. Scottish Fire and Rescue says 60 firefighters were at the scene. In a statement, it's been called a very complex incident. Health bosses are calling for the government to declare a major incident within the NHS over mounting pressure on the service. The Society for Acute Medicine has called the current situation urgent. The government says it recognises the pressure faced by the NHS, but the Royal College of Emergency Medicine claims as many as 500 people could be dying each week because of delays to critical care. And former tennis star Martina Navratilova has been diagnosed with throat and breast cancer. The former world number one previously underwent treatment for early stage breast cancer back in 2010. The 66 year old says the new diagnosis is a double whammy and serious but still fixable. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Patrick will be back in just a moment. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Okay, people, we should all be going back to work tomorrow. Instead, many of us will decide to work at home or take a few more days off, sorry for some, as the ongoing strikes by railway workers continue this week. Members of the RMT union and 14 train operators will stage two 40-hour walkouts tomorrow and Friday this week. Wow, train drivers, and that, I think, will really stick in the craw because they're on a wedge in the Aslev union, will strike on Thursday. Our GB News South West reporter Jeff Moody has spent today in Barnstable in North Devon, where these fresh set of strikes are expected to cut the station off completely. Good grief. Well, it's all back to work tomorrow after the Christmas break, unless, of course, you take a train, in which case it's going to be very difficult. This week we've got two uh, strikes from the RMT, 48-hour strikes, one tomorrow and then one on Friday, and then sandwiched right in the middle of that, we've got one from the Train Drivers Union, ASLEF, as well. That's on Thursday, so massive disruptions on the train this week. There will be some services available. There'll be services tomorrow uh, from 7.30 in the morning till 6.30 in the evening, but that's only about 20% of normal services. And then on the, the one on Thursday, the ASLEF strike, even less. So the message is coming out, stay home if you possibly can, don't use the railways. And talking to people here in Barnstable today, that's what they're saying they're doing. They're saying they're going to extend their Christmas break for another week, try and do a little bit of work from home, but certainly not attempt to get into the office, which obviously is going to have a huge knock-on effect to an already beleaguered economy. Well, what do the experts have to say about this today? The, the people responsible? Well, the rail delivery group says no one wants to see these strikes go ahead and we can only apologise to passengers. The uh, ASLEF has said we don't want to go on strike either, but the companies have pushed us into this place. Uh, Mick Lynch has been commenting. He has said he really wants to reach a deal. He wants to put a proposal, a pay deal, to his members so they can vote on it. But until the government gives him one, the government gives him some options, there's nothing further that he can do. And finally, uh, the Department for Transport has said, well, look, passengers have rightly had enough of rail strikes. They want the disruption to end. Talking to people here in Barnstable today, there's still a certain level of support for the strikes. There's still a lot of good grace when it comes to the RMT in particular, but that good grace, that support does seem to be waning slightly as we go into the new year. OK, good stuff, Jeff. But I want to drill down into what on earth these strikes are actually costing our economy at the moment and our retail sector. I think it's tantamount to economic terrorism, frankly, as it comes amid the findings that almost 50 shops closed down daily in 2022. But also, people, it's not all doom and gloom here because we're going to have a little bit of good economic news for you. Justin Urquhart Stewart and his fabulous braces. <laughs> Join me right now, economist and co-founder of Regionally is with me now. First and foremost... What are this lot of striking workers, these trots, costing us on a daily basis? Well, uh, actually, the impact they're actually having 
is actually relatively minor. I know it's tiresome, ah. I know it's for headlines. The issue is, of course, we've just spent a couple of years on, uh, mm. on lockdown and things like that. We've got used to working from home. We've got used to buying things online. Mm. So also the fact you've actually got all the other delivery mechanisms working. So actually a lot of these well, ones... 1.5 well, billion in December alone for a hospitality sector. Yeah, not so minor for them. That's, that's bad news for really for them. But that was going to be happening anyway um, because that was going to see the cost of uh, fuel going right. up quite so much. It was going to be incredibly difficult. So it's going to be painful to start with uh, next year, but you will start seeing a turnaround round right about the summer. Why? Because what we're used to at the moment is double-digit inflation. Mm. Remember, that's done month by month by month. And every month that goes by, one of those inflationary figures drops off. Then when you start seeing the next round of wage rises, they'll be higher than inflation. So a little bit more positive attitude coming through. Mm. And so that's what you have a few months of that, people starting to feel a little bit better off. Not hugely. Mm. There's one other item as well which really annoys me when people say, that's a recession. Mm. It's a recession. This is not a disaster. It's a slowdown in the economy. It'll be probably around about 1% to 2%. You go back to 2008, and there weren't a recession we had of 2000 and before that. You just go about double digit with one stage, 20% fall in GDP. No, 2% is almost tiny, barely measurable. Um, and so, actually, put it into context, it's not as bad as people love to make out. OK, but if I was a striking rail worker, say, or somebody else, now would be my point of maximum opportunity to try to get a deal, would it not? Because if the economy is going to get better, and actually, frankly, the government doesn't need to give them a deal going forward. No. What you've got now is uh, time to do a deal to try and put pressure on them, but actually it's a position where people say, well, I don't need to go into the office. We've already been trained to work exactly. at home. I can do everything else at home. It's fairly pointless. Plus the fact you're going to have to reform the railways anyway, there's going to be significant changes. So would it be an expensive mistake for the government right now and a, a mistake that the taxpayer would have to bear the brunt of if the government caved into wage demands at this moment in time? Yes, it'd be a big mistake. What you should do is you take, right, here are the wage rises going up at a steady level. Yeah. You may, it's perfectly reasonable to actually hear say that actually there's an increment to be paid for an inflationary spike with a few hundred pounds, a thousand pounds, whatever it happens to be, for those people affected. You separate it out from pay. Mm. You don't bed it into the pay system. There's your inflationary money, and there's your pay just carrying on like that. Now, take that, and most people say, that's fair. Yeah. But, and actually, the... the, the, the... Uh, unions say that they're on the side of the workers. But actually, at the minute, it's the government on the side of the workers because there are more workers in this country than the people in the unions who are going on strike. And it's those people who have to pay for the wage increases. So the government, by virtue of, well, I was going to say not negotiating, doing the mm. square root of well, when it comes to negotiating at the minute, is doing right by your average normal worker on the street. And what they need to be doing is getting that message better and far stronger yes, across yes. to them, actually saying, look, this is the benefit you will be having. If we end up uh, paying them more, bear in mind, it's not government money, it's your mm. money as a taxpayer that's going that way. Yes, indeed. So they need to be louder and shouting in the rooftops in that. How long is it before the unions cave, do you reckon? Uh, it'll take about three or four months, because after that, they're running out of money, so they can't provide all the strike pay for all of those sort of things. Plus the fact, actually, with people wanting to start going back to work again, and actually the economy will start also to start moving out of its recession, albeit a low one. OK, right, so it's you and I now. We're at the start of 2023. It's so the first show I've done of the year, and you're going to give us a little bit of economic optimism. This time next year, I'll be sitting here with you and your wonderful braces, and we'll be looking out at a much better economic picture for Britain, will we? Yes, we will. And you can see that, because inflation will be lower, growth will be back, unemployment still low mm. and you'll have more investment coming in to those growth areas of the UK economy, which are the high-tech centres, not in the South East, but throughout the United Kingdom. They're already there. Don't give them extra capital from the government. No, no, give them the tax breaks to attract more investment for medium long-term investing. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Justin. Absolutely. Always an absolute pleasure, my good man. Justin O'Connor Stewart there, economist and co-founder of Regionally, painting a, a slightly rosy economic forecast. Just hang tight, people. Things can only get better. So I want to write a song about that. Anyway, lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives. Why? Well, because I asked you, but mainly because I said, well, there's millions and millions and millions of people out there, according to the latest survey, that show they're undecided as to who to vote for in the next general election. So we look at the opinion polls, it puts Labour way ahead. Yeah, fine, OK, Labour are ahead. I think if there was a general election tomorrow, no doubt Labour would win. I think it'd be relatively close, but Labour would win. But the next election is roughly speaking, two years away, 18 months away, and a lot can change, and there's a lot up for grabs. And I asked you, what would Rishi Sunak have to do to get your vote? Sue says, it's unlikely I will vote Conservative at the next general election because Rishi Sunak is basically a ghost. Where the hell is he? Uh, well, yes, OK, it's a decent point. I mean, I think a lot of people would maybe like to see him a little bit more visible. Tough times, though, for old Rishi. He's fighting fires on multiple different forums. Janice says, to get my vote, Rishi Sunak needs to stop the boats 
and deport illegals in their thousands. Sort the NHS, fix the cost of living and get tougher on crime. So hang on a minute, Janice. What you're telling me, and this is shocking stuff, is that you would quite like your Conservative Prime Minister to be a Conservative, would you? You'd quite like him to be, be tough with borders and be tough on law and order and sort out the NHS, but also fix the cost of living crisis, so stop taxing us to high heaven. No way, Janice, no way. You're a mad woman. Anyway, Glennis says, the existing political parties will not get my vote again. They've blown it. What a shambles. I'll be voting Reform UK at the next general election. And I'm in a red wall seat. And this, I think, Glynis, fantastic name, Glynis, uh, is actually bang on trend. And one thing that I wanted to know from people, which is that actually, are you just sick and tired now of the two main parties? My only concern, Glynis, and I'm not calling you weak for a single second, is that I hear this a lot from a lot of people. Oh, I'm never going to vote Tory again. I'm never going to vote Labour again. I'm going to vote for this third or fourth party, whatever you want to call it, uh, a, a newer party. And then it never really materialises, does it? It never really happens. I think people get into that polling booth and something happens. They just think, oh, I'll go with what I know. I'll go with what I know. But I wonder now, when you look around at the state this country is in, on multiple different forums, I love this country. I absolutely love this country. But I cannot... I feel sad. I feel sad at the state of it. And I just wonder whether that tipping point has been reached, Glynis, and maybe you, along with millions of people whose voters are up for grabs, will go, actually, enough's enough now. I am going to vote for a different party. Cynthia says, is there any point voting at all? Let's face it. When we do, they take out what the people voted it in and put in what they intended to have in power. Oh, I see what you mean. OK, all right, yes, I get what you're saying there, Cynthia. So basically what you're saying is that, yeah, they'll do what they want anyway. I understand that. that your, first, your first point there, is there any point in voting at all? It could go that way, Cynthia, and it could go that way, ladies and gentlemen. I wouldn't be surprised if the turnout at the next general election was shockingly... Low. Voter apathy, political homelessness in this country, absolutely rife. Let's move on. In an interview, Harry was speaking to ITV. This is Harry off of Harry and Meghan, right? Uh, saying, yeah, Meghan's simp, yeah. Harry was speaking to ITV, talking about his fallout with the royal family, saying, it didn't have to be this way. It needed to be this way. The leaking and the planting. I want a family, not an institution. They feel as though it's better to keep us somehow as the villains. They've shown absolutely no willingness to reconcile. I would like to get my father back. I would like to have my brother back. OK. Prince Harry says that his family had shown no willingness to reconcile. I'm not but it's willingness to reconcile. You go on Oprah, you write a book that, by all accounts, slams your family. You do a Netflix documentary series that, by all accounts, slams your family. You make your grandma's life miserable in their last years. You make your granddad's life miserable in his last years. You mug your brother off left, right and centre. You, do, you turn your back on your country and call us all racist. I mean, I'm not being funny, Harry, but is it any wonder why people don't want to have your back on this particular issue? They made no effort to reconcile. Yeah, they're glad to see the back of you, mate. Anyway... Right, this comes... Sorry, God, it all came over me. This comes as he launches fresh attacks before his autobiography, Spare. It's published on the 10th of January. With me now, to restore some sanity to proceedings, is Rafe Haydel Mangu, Royal Broadcaster and commentator. Rafe, I forgot myself there. Talk to me about this. Harry, with his favourite journalist, it would appear anyway, saying that his family... He wants his family back, does he? Well, I mean, you've taken the wind out of my own rant that I was just <laughs> going to have with that wonderful diatribe of yours. I mean, absolutely. I mean, he says he wants to have his, his father and his brother back. I don't know what charm school he's been to, but I think uh, if he did go to one, how to win friends and influence people wasn't on his reading list, given that uh, list that you just described there, his memoir, the Netflix documentary. I mean, the reality is... The royal family have been trying to reconcile. We saw the king deliver that wonderfully warm uh, speech in which he name-checked Harry and Meghan building their lives overseas. We saw his brother, Prince William, uh, Prince William, the Prince of Wales and the Princess of Wales, extending an olive branch after the queen died by inviting them to join them as in a fab four once again to view the flowers laid at Windsor Castle for their grandmother. And what was their response to these two olive branches? There was a hope that there might be a perfect chance for reconciliation. The death of a family member bringing people closer together, the accession of the king setting their minds to something more important than their California grievances. No, instead they launched a nuclear strike on, uh, on the royal family with the Netflix documentary. And it seems now as if we're going to have yet another nuclear strike, albeit this one targeted more specifically on Prince William and Kate and perhaps on, on Camilla too, the Queen. So, uh, yes, uh, I think any reconciliation is now kicked far into the long grass. 
Yeah, reports that Prince Harry's going to go into minute, minute-by-minute minute detail of an epic row that he had with his brother. Look, we all have rows with family members. Brothers fall out all the time. Siblings fall out all the time. Why does he feel the need to tell us about all of this? I think this is exactly the point we're talking about. All families are the same. We've all had emotional fights with our family. I'm sure in the last few days over Christmas, many of people around the country will can sympathise with those sorts of fights. And uh, we all say things we regret and things we're just lucky there are no cameras recording what happens in the heat of the moment. And for someone to then go and blab that to the press and the media in such mm. a public way uh, is, I just th I think, completely unacceptable and really goes, I think, to the heart of the problem here, which is that the Sussexes depend upon the royal family for everything that they have. All of their money that they have now is generated by this institution that they claim to, to loathe. And yeah. I'm just uh, you know, so glad the Queen isn't here to see this, no. to see her grandson you know, destroy the reputation of, of, the, of the family that she did mm. so much to uphold and her legacy and introduce the institution that's given them everything. Talking of families over Christmas, I was speaking with mine a little bit, Rafe, over the Christmas period, and inevitably the Meghan and Harry stuff came up, mainly because I'm actually in the documentary. I don't like to go on about it, Rafe. I don't like to go on about it. Uh, don't fancy I hate when people bring it up. That I was on the uh, in the Meghan and Harry thing. It's I, I, I rather don't want the fame anyway. Um, but uh, but the over the overbearing sense that I've had from family and friends on this is they feel a bit sorry for Harry. Hear me out. They think he's a bit screwed up. Do you think he is? I think so too. I mean, what I got from the Netflix documentary and other utterances over the past few months is that increasingly uh, we, we have clear evidence that uh, Harry is merely the mouthpiece for Meghan. Uh, he's never been the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree, uh, but she's a very savvy man manipulator. And I th think you can really see that she's the puppet master or, dare I say, even the ventriloquist here. And yes, clearly Prince Harry has been severely damaged by... Uh, this, the sad events of 1997 with the death of his mother. It's been a dark cloud. He's, he's married this woman. He's projected very much his mother's sentiment into his wife and is trying to create a sort of parallel Diana with her. And yeah. unfortunately, yes. he's been taken advantage of. That's true. I mean, I'm not being funny, but Freud would have an absolute field day with Harry, wouldn't he? The way that he's treating Meghan and... Uh... Well, mummy issues, to say the least. So thank you very much, Rafe. Great to have you on the show. As ever, my good man, happy new year to you. Happy new year, of course, as well. Rafe Hadelmanku, their royal broadcaster and commentator. And this is just reacting to the news. We're going to be treated to a Harry interview, aren't we? With a particular chap from ITV, his favourite chosen journalist, followed by the release of his book, Spare, in a couple of weeks' time. No doubt this will provide fodder for me and you as well. It gets us all very irate, doesn't it? But lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on the warnings that Channel Crossings Channel migrant numbers could double this year. Barbara says, Migrants have moved into my local hotel. It's gorgeous. Weddings and Christmas parties all cancelled. At Christmas, they had full central heating, food and Christmas lights while I struggled to decide how low to have my thermostat. And Barbara, I'm desperately sorry to hear about your personal situation. And I think it, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's all skew if, isn't it, Barbara? It is all completely skew if at the moment. Topsy turvy, you name it, that's what it is. John says, I will vote Conservative if they stop these illegal channel crossings. Sort out the Northern Ireland Protocol, give the fishermen the UK back in that sorry, the fishermen in the UK back their fishing waters and start fracking. In other words, do what they said they were going to do. And you know what, John? It's depressingly simple in that regard, isn't it? Yes, despite the fact there are massive complications with all of those different elements, like sorting out what's going on the channel and all of that stuff. Yeah, fine. But actually, what you just said there is do what they said they were going to do. Yeah, I know. It really shouldn't be that hard. We are years on from them saying they were going to do that. And alas, here we are, different prime, two different prime ministers, actually. And goodness knows who else. George says, time for one more quick one before I... Throw you over to the wonderful Michelle Trubri. It's absolutely no use expecting France to help with our migrant problem when they have a far worse migrant problem of their own. What are our Border Force people doing on the French beaches? There we go. Right, thank you very much, everybody who's been getting in touch. GBviews at gbnews.uk. I love to hear from you, but someone else I'd love to hear from is the wonderful Michelle Jubri, who's with you with Jubes and Co. Michelle, what's on? Happy New Year to you. I've got Happy a burn to pick with you, by the way. You just said you'd love to hear from me. You ruined the end of my 2022, Patrick, because oh. I listened to your show every word of it, and I emailed you in, and I was waiting. 
I was really desperately oh. excited for my email to be read out and you didn't read it out. I'm sorry, Michelle, so, it's because I get millions. It's, it's the curse of popularity, Michelle. I feel anyone's paying the emails in and don't get it read out was not happy. <laughs> it was a sad end to my, uh, my, my year, I can tell you. Anyway, very briefly, coming up on my show tonight, Patrick, I've got one question for my viewers. Yeah. Uh, let's face it, the UK is in a bit of a mess. How are we going to fix it? I want the viewers five answers. I want your top priorities. Where should our focus be? Not just politics, beyond. How are we going to fix this country? We'll come up with a little plan and Rishi Sunak can have it for free. Oh, I tell you what, Michelle, you're back with a bang. Thank you very much, Michelle Jubri. There, will be with you for Jubes and Co. For the next hour, what an hour that's going to be. Thank you very much for everybody who's been watching and listening. I've been Patrick Christie's. This is Indeed GB News. I'll be back covering for Mark Stein, 8 till 9pm. I'll see you in a couple of hours. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking mostly dry and settled, but with a few showers in the far northwest. Here are the details. It will be a fine start to the evening across the southwest of England. The wind will be light and skies will be mostly clear, allowing temperatures to dip fairly quickly. The southeast of England will experience similar conditions with generally dry weather, no more than a gentle breeze and plenty of clear periods. The odd patch of cloud is possible near to the south coast of Wales, but it will be a dry early evening elsewhere with clear periods. A ridge of high pressure will be toppling across the Midlands from the west, helping to give light winds and a quiet early evening. It will be turning chilly though under the long cloud breaks. Chilly too for the northeast of England where skies will generally be clear, a bit more breeze is likely than further south but temperatures will still begin to fall away. One or two areas of low cloud will drift across southern Scotland from the west but it will stay dry with some clear spells. Northern and western Scotland might catch a shower. The breeze will gradually start to pick up across Northern Ireland heading into the evening, although at this point it will be dry and there will be some clear breaks. It will turn frosty this evening, especially in the east. However, wet and windy conditions will reach many areas from the west later. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, 